And we're live, or at least that's what StreamYard tells me. That's what they say. But let's let's just look here. Maybe maybe we are. Maybe we aren't. I don't know. You know, cardboard head guys yeah. early. We're live. We're good. There we go. Let me get over to the comments here. Cardboard head guy. The topic tonight is divisive albums and polarizing artists. As the ticker says along the bottom there. James, for older people, Taylor Swift, let's let's tread gently on the Taylor Swift thing. Well, more on that later. Maybe more favorable no responses <laughs> years going. Hey, Trevor. I mean, I don't know if he grabbed him or not, but that was one of the first things I thought of for Sam was the monkeys. See, I don't, as you and I, I think you and I have talked about, I don't get the monkey. I don't get what the deal with the monkeys is. Yeah, I, right, but that, that's the point, right? Like, Right. But, um, yeah, the Billy Joel song comes out tomorrow. No music talk from John's got a hard on for that. Trevor's here. Hey, Trevor. You got some more Asti tonight, there, Rob? Yeah, I just this is this is the no name brand Asti. <laughs> <laughs> no name brand. Are they are yeah. they sponsoring you yet or what? Nah, man they 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 didn't even get back to me so. If you've noticed, I haven't asked Heat in a few weeks. You should you should reach out to them. Oh, I did. That's did you really? And yeah. Did you seriously? Yeah, they have like a a uh, a form on their website that you can fill out if you're interested in a sponsorship. No kidding. Yeah, I linked them to your channel though, so I was uh, like, "This is." Listen, <laughs> I already I already have a deal with Vinyl Storage Solutions, so. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't think they're competitors. They're probably not. There's Samuel, and he's on time. Hey, Sam. Howdy, boys. Northern and Jason. Hey, Peter. Sam. <laughs> we got ten people on? watching already, and we're all on time. This is this is this is what happens when Glenn's not around. Those are just my ten different channels that I've logged into. Oh, uh, okay. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. How's everybody doing? You you good, Sam? How's the weather down there? Uh, today it got almost up to fifty. Well, the thing was just right at 50 Fahrenheit. Um, there, they had a, there was a little bit of a wintry mix in some places this morning, like a frost. But other than that, it's pretty mild. Um, How's yeah. it out there in BC, Jason? It's I know there's a heat wave going through Western Canada right now. Oh my God, it was ridiculous. It was like 10 degrees the other day. It felt like spring. You're warmer uh, than me, man. I'm. Uh, yeah, it was. The bees were all out. It was just crazy. We're plus three. And there's virtually no snow. There's a few snow banks here and there, and that's it. It's great. Did you say the bees were out? I have bees, yeah. <laughs> like you're a bee farmer? I have a couple of hives, and they are, it was so nice and warm out that they were all like starting to come out of the hive. I'm like, ah, oh, go back in. It's not time yet. I just have I just have this vision of Jason in like his his Pooh Bear costume, right? The red shirt, and no pants, yeah. but his hand in the honey pot. <laughs> 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 It's not right. No, I don't know what's wrong about it. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's true that J Jason isn't uh, honey. Honey, as we know it, is simply bee uh, puke, right? Yeah. Drink, drink the nectar, spit it out. Get well, thanks for ruining it for us. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Well, it's 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 less troubling than when you think of an egg. <laughs> Of course, I guess when you think of milk, that's kind of an unpleasant thing, too, when you think about it. Yeah, I always milk. think about who was the first guy to say, you know what I want? I want something out of that cow. Yeah. <laughs> and you know where I'm going to get it from? That thing right there. That, that dangly thing. thing. Yeah. I can, grab, I can do more than one at once. <laughs> as long as, yeah, as long as you're not milking the bulls, right? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, Rob, we're on your channel. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, we're just, the Wednesday night. <laughs> let, let's save this for the after dark, folks. You're right. I got to save some material. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I guess we're we're five minutes. I don't know what to do because Sam's on time. So normally we, we just shoot the shit. Well, I can go. I can, I can go. No, no. You. Say hi I to the go. guys in the comments there. We got a lot of people. In here. Yeah, right, we so. got cardboard head guy James Trevor Music Sanctuary Beer and Vinyl. Who's that guy? I never heard of him before. Yeah, FBA Twelve degrees. Christopher. Hey everybody, we got we're up to fifteen people. Are right, this is uh, this is exciting? So for those that uh, didn't read the ticker on the bottom there, we decided we're going to talk about divisive albums 
and polarizing artist. Glenn can't be with us tonight because he thinks having a family vacation in Florida is more important than being on YouTube. So, you know, he can't get his priorities straight, but he'll be back with us next week. So couldn't be me. We thought we'd uh, we'd share some albums that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of bands that, that maybe have an album that uh, divides the fan base. Some think is uh, crap and some think is good. And there's also artists that we're, we may talk about that are that are pretty polarizing. And to qualify that, we're not talking about, uh, for example, we're not going to talk about how Kid Rock is polarizing because he's a dickhead. <laughs> Because oh, it's political. Video. If we if we were to talk about Kid Rock being, uh, you know, polarizing, it would be from a musical standpoint. I mean, I just use that as an example yeah. because we're not. He's not polarizing musically. I mean, he's a prog genius. So, I, I and I don't think anybody would question that. Right? No, I mean, he made one of those landmark. I mean, what, what was that? Part of the Kim's, Crimson King, and then Cocky. I mean, like. You know, yeah, genre defining. And if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, you got to watch my prog tag. So, mm. yeah, that was brilliant. So that's uh, that's kind of what we're going to chat about. I think we've all pulled some stuff to uh, to share. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't matter whether you do the album or the artist or whatever. Just uh, pull it out and talk about it. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Since Sam was on time, he should have the honor of going first. Well, I'm going to go with a, uh, a theme, which uh, I got to give Alex kind of a kind of credit for, for nudging me in this direction. So I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to stick to one artist. Don't do uh, it. I told Rob that you were thinking about doing this. I was... <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the thing is like, this is a guy that's had like seven careers in his it's life. True. And uh -huh. I've got to go with, I've got to go with my, my man, Bobby. Um, yep. So I'm going to be talking about Bob Dylan all night. So, oh, Steve, good night, everybody. Yeah, uh, the greatest songwriter who ever lived. <laughs> um, and I mean, again, to kind of go with the, with the topic, I'm not talking about Bob's politics because obviously he was, you know, early on was a protest singer, you know, during the civil rights movement and all that good stuff. But his first big move, I mean, you could really look at any Bob Dylan album and say that it was him being divisive because, I mean, his first album was almost all cover songs. And then he immediately comes out with with a uh, free will and Bob Dylan, which has, you know, blowing in the wind. Don't think twice. It's all right. A hard rain's going to fall. Some of his biggest songs. And then, you know, you can skip ahead a couple of records and then you go to another side of Bob Dylan, which was his last fully acoustic album up until the nineties where he was, you know, singing kind of like poppier, more free flowing lyrics um, with his folk styling. But this is the album, um, and I don't have it on vinyl. Yeah, there you go, Jason. Bringing it all back home. Um, this is the album where Dylan got a lot of flack, probably for the first time fully in his career. This is the album where Dylan goes electric. Um, I mean, the, the first two-thirds of the album are all uh, – it's, it's all electric – songs like you have subterranean homesick blue she belongs to me maggie's farm love minus zero um and then you know it finishes the electric side with bob dylan's 115th dream and then you have the acoustic side with mr tambourine man um it's all right ma um it's all over now baby blue but the thing with this album is that you know people were thinking like oh he's sold out um and this is 1965 dylan's only 24 years old and I always like to compare myself to these 24 year olds because Brian Wilson. Like you were going to say, I always compare myself hey, to Bob listen, Dylan. Sam always yeah. compares himself to Bob Dylan. I do. Yeah. yeah. I'm essentially Bob Anybody Dylan. Anybody would. Okay. I'm the non the non Jewish Bob Dylan. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> no, but, but what's crazy is that at 24 years old, <laughs> Bob Dylan put this out. You know, Brian Wilson put out Pet Sounds at 24. Um, it's just it's just insane what some of these guys were doing and like the 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 you know the prolific nature of the of those years for these guys in the mid 60s but i mean i had to go with with bringing it all back home i mean it's a killer record um again dylan got booed when he was promoting this album at newport folk festival um we all know the story pete seeger you know, was at the festival and people say he had an ax and he was going to cut the lines, yeah. which ended up being debunked. But, um, 
yeah, bringing it all back home. That's kind of like the first huge transitional era of Bob Dylan. So I'm going to go with that. Can I speak to that? I'll just call it my turn so I can spread out my, yeah. Your uh, love, your yeah. goods. So Sam hit it on the head about like his age, how young he was. And I think when I got into Dylan, the, the biggest thing that got me into Dylan was understanding the impact this guy had when he was so bloody young. Like how intelligent and smart and like socially aware, if anything else, this young guy had to be and be pumping out songs and nonstop. And you read about it and you can read like quotes from like Baez saying things like, yeah, he'd be up all night just writing. Like, mm-hmm. He'd just be at the typewriter all night long and doing this yep. and that. And like, I, I can't not appreciate that level of Bob Dylan. Every time I put an album on, I always want to know how old was he when he did this album? How old mm-hmm. was he when he did this album? And it's That's always true. like, well, especially the early eras, it's always very impressive, right? You said he was 24 at this one? 24. Wow, that's insane. Like, I still don't have that kind of maturity. Like, I, <laughs> I, I can never put this kind that, of stuff out. Yep. Is that um, there a 2 eye Columbia there, Jason? American. Look at you go. American. Sam, you don't have this on vinyl? No, I, I own very little Dylan on vinyl, believe it or not. Is that something you want? Well, sure. Yeah. Okay. I want lots That's of things, you know, happiness and <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> okay. I can finally, I can finally send you something. I'll send you this one. I have a Canadian pressing. This is now yours. Woo! Thank you, there Jason. You it cost me about $300 to send it to you. But don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> My man, that's for you. It's coming. Hey, thank you. It's on the record too. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it's no, it's no secret. I don't like Bob Dylan at all. <laughs> I know that may come as a hot take for some folks, but what I will say about Dylan going electric is that launched the career of one of my favorite acts, the band. That was his. That was the band that toured with him when he went electric, and because of that, they became the band and put out music from Big Pink. And so, while I don't like Dylan. The songs are fine. I just think you can't sing for shit. Oh. Um, and that, again, it's my opinion. I don't know anything from anything. Change the I'm topic not. to dis- divisive YouTubers and polarizing artists. There you go, right? <laughs> well, but that's the whole point of this topic, right? Is It's, yeah. it's divisive. Oh, I yeah. do not like Bob Dylan. Respect his songwriting, but that's it. But what I, my point is I, I respect that album because it led to the career of one of my favorite acts of all time, so... I love, I, I couldn't believe it when I started to learn about Dylan and then learning about the band. Like, I was so impressed that they were like his chosen ones. Like, Dylan, of all people, like, I want these guys. Like, these yeah. guys will come with me. These guys will stick it out with me on the stage, you know. And I think, I think when they did the tour where they, they yelled Judas and all that stuff, I think it was, it wasn't even Levon on the drums, though, was it? It was, no, uh, it was uh, Mickey, Mickey, uh... Mickey Jones. Mickey Jones, who yeah. you might recognize from Home Improvement. He played one of Tim's friends in Home Improvement. I know. I didn't know. He, he, he got a long ponytail. He's a big guy with a beard, blonde hair. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. yeah. That's I didn't cool. know that. Yep. Yeah, so Levon wasn't on that that crucial, crazy 65 tour, I don't yeah. think. No, he was No, he was yeah. – He and actually, when they did when they did the basement tapes that were at a Big Pink, Levon, Levon missed like the first two or three weeks. Really, eh? Yeah. Jeez. Let's I see know. what the uh, Walnut Gallery is saying here. The three electric yeah, Bob oh. Dylan albums were recorded in just 14 months, and one is a double. Okay. Isn't I've... that insane? Like, again, the guy is, like, in his mid-20s, and he's pumping out, like, what will always be the greatest, like, arguably, on the, in the conversation for the greatest albums of all time. Three yep. in a row yep. at, in his mid-20s. Unbelievable. This is already the comment of the night. I was producing human children and I was 24. Good for you, Joel. I love that. Yikes. Him and Nick Cannon. Yeah. I was practicing a lot, but you know. Yo. <laughs> Dylan is one of the most influential artists in rock. I don't think anyone can dispute that for sure. No guilt. Hey, Trevor. Mm-hmm. I love Dylan's bringing it. All home. Hello, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Dylan's own singing voice, exactly, is very divisive. Yep. 
As a kid, I listened to my older brother's albums and discovered Lightfoot through his Don Quixote. I was floored. Love there you go. Lightfoot. All right. Since Rob. Jason's already gone, Alex, here. That's right. Yeah, I'm done. All right. So th this my my first choice is uh, a little bit of both. Um, divisive album, really divisive person, um, both artistically. And just as a human being and politically and all that kind of stuff, we don't. I thought you. Much. I thought you were going to go Def Leppard here when they went mainstream. I, I got a lot of choices here, Rob. Well, I'm just you know, that's right. that's that's your band, man. Uh, well, you know, I, I, it, it's in the order that it fell. All right. Um, but you know, this is a a band that you know was, you know, one of the highest selling, most successful, biggest bands of all time. You know, they put out arguably the greatest record of all time in 1973. They put out arguably just as good of a record in 75. They arguably put out just as good of a record in 77. But in 77, with that record, people saw the writing on the wall maybe a little bit. Of course, the writing on the wall might be a bit of a burying the lead here. Because in 79, you could argue, you know, a lot of people talk about the wall. And I'm not going to talk about the wall. But specifically, I'm going to talk about the final cut. From mm. from Pink Floyd because and and, and it's a, it's a double pick because it's a it's formally a Pink Floyd record but this is really a Roger Waters solo album um, it, for all intents and purposes and a lot of people have said like I wish I would feel a lot better about Roger and Pink Floyd at this junction of their career if this was just released as a Roger so uh, Roger Waters solo album so it's kind of both Roger is a very uh, divisive and polarizing figure artistically and otherwise anyway, but specifically this is an interesting pick to me because I've never, I like this album. I actually, I, I really like this album. I don't love it. I've never gotten, I don't want to say I haven't gotten the hate because I get it. I think because I'm a big fan of Rogers solo albums Um and this falls right into it in so many ways. And so I think that's like a huge thing of like later on, I really, you know, started enjoying Roger's solo records. And then this one totally falls right into it. Um, and so, you know, yeah, it, I mean, this really is a, a total, you know, I don't even know what people are playing on here. Right. Like, and again, you could argue that the wall as great a, and as historic as the wall is, I mean, that was Roger's creation, right? I mean, that yeah. whole creative everything was Roger's creation at this point in the game. I mean, Rick Wright was getting fired all over the place, right? Um, Nick Mason doesn't even play on some songs. I remember the, we're talking about The Wall now, but, you know, it's like I, the song uh, uh, Mother, which is an amazing song, Nick Mason doesn't even play on because it was too hard for him to play in five. Uh, and so they brought in Jeff Beccaro from Toto and a million other things to play. Really? really? Holy crazy. And again, like that was probably all a Roger Waters choice. And I'm a huge David Gilmour fan, but at this point in the career of Pink Floyd, he was sort of relegated to, hey, play a couple guitar solos when I want you to, right? Like that was his role. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, post-war dream, you know, big concept album. This record's depressing as hell. It's all about Roger's you know, father who, who, you know, died in the war. I don't know if he died in the war, died shortly after the war, whole thing. Um, not exactly a lift, uh, you know, something that makes you feel better. Uh, but I've always loved the gunner's dreams uh, is, is I've always just had this record to me has always just had this serenity about it in a really sad way. I've always enjoyed it, but I totally also recognize the hate for it and that it's hugely polarizing both because it's a Roger, basically a Roger record, and it noted pretty much the end of Pink Floyd as we knew them. Uh, and it's just not a great record in the grand scheme of things and where they were sort of coming from. So, uh, yeah, my first pick is uh, the final cut from Pink Floyd slash Roger Waters, depending on how you want to look at it. Why, nice. Alex, why do people shit on Roger Waters? Like, was he, do people just well, not like him because he's a, a creative controlling kind of asshole type or is he, is there something else going on or like what, what is the Coles notes version on the general take on Roger Waters? Yeah. I mean that, that would lead us. Yeah. I mean, that would lead probably down like a path that we're not going to jump into on the, on the stream just because I mean a lot of politics and socioeconomic sure. stuff and just comments that he has made. But I think from the artistic lens, that's a lot yeah. of it, right? Like yep. he's very, I think, 
as a human, as an artist, brilliant, right? Like yeah. artistically brilliant. Um, as a human, I think challenging at best. Mm-hmm. And so, um, well, I, but as an artist, yeah. was it just was it was that just it that him and Gilmore just butted heads so often, and it was always just a power, you know, battle and all that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. And it, it sounds like, I mean, who knows, right? Like this is like the longest lasting feud yeah. in rock and roll history in so many ways. You know, they did, uh, Pink Floyd did come together. If you all remember Live Aid, uh, what was that? 2005? Eight, 2005, Live oh, Aid, yeah. yep. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, Live Eight. my apologies, yeah. Because it was what, eight different cities and all that kind of stuff. Like I remember being 15 and watching that and like, they played the stuff and it was like, Oh my God, this is the official thing. Um, but yeah, him and him and David just never, never got along. And what really him and everybody else just never, never got along for a lot of different reasons. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's always been a complicated thing, right? Like I love what he has put out, love the, well, most of what he has put out. Uh, I really like his solo albums. Not going to talk about dark side redux. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a comment in there about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was over someone's asking your thoughts on it. <laughs> you know what? No thoughts on it. You know, it's just, uh, yeah. I uh, I, would, I wouldn't have touched that. It feels weird that he did that. Yeah. Like, and it depends, right? Like, and not to go down, the, it's kind of a long path, but it's like, I, there's part of me, you know, I try to see the best in these things. I appreciate that he didn't just try to do like a replication of it, right? Like, like a re-recording of it. Like it is a very completely different reinterpretation. It's just not a good one. Right. And so it's like, you know, yeah, but uh, yeah. So James is saying he never bought the final cut. He thinks it's a little boring and he only liked the David Gilmore song on it. I would agree. It's a lot of boring. Um, <laughs> it is a, it's a boring album, but I like that. Yeah. Steve says he just tuned in. Final cut, Mrs. Gilmore. And the wall is overbloated. I feel that. Nick yeah. Mason was not involved due to staying home shooting heroin. Nick Mason just turned 80 the other night. Yeah, and see what that heroin did for him? Him and Keith. Keep it going. Uh, what are we doing wrong, Sam? <laughs> Steve says, Jason, you can tune in on any recent quotes from Roger over the last five years to get an <laughs> idea of why he's a white true. We'll talk off camera, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they did it or Bob Geloff was calling the Spice Girls. Oh, wow. You missed our pre-chat offline. <laughs> we were chatting about the Spice Girls. So. Oh, gosh. I'm glad I missed that, too. <laughs> All right. Listen, All Mr. Right, Rob, what do you got? Boys. So let's, you know, hey, careful on Come the on. Spice Girl. So teach, I'm, I'm going to go with a, an album that I think is divisive by probably the least divisive band that there ever was. That's the Beatles. Wow. I'm going to go Beatles for sale. Interesting. Okay. Because here's the thing. You watch many of the Beatles ranking videos that people do on, on the VC, and you read a lot of articles, and, and this consistently ranks near the bottom of everyone's, you know, how do I rank the Beatles albums? And the thought process behind this is in 1964, they recorded two studio albums, and they filmed their first feature film, Hard Day's Night. And they did a world tour and contractual obligations where they had to get an album done before Christmas. So they were exhausted. I mean, they had worked the entire year without a break. Yeah. As Steve says in the comment or Jeff says in the comments there, the tired album, Mm -hmm. everyone goes, Oh, they look tired on the cover. I love, love, love this album. One of my, absolute favorites of the early period of the Beatles and actually of their entire catalog, to be quite honest, you know, it has that Beatlemania sound, but what I love about it is it, it, it's, it's a little deeper than the, she loves you. I want to hold your hand. Like, you know, it starts, I mean, it starts off depressing. You've got no reply, which is a very depressing John song. Then you've got, I'm a loser. That is unlike anything that the Beatles had recorded or written previously to that. I mean, it, it, it's John basically saying, you know, that, uh, I, I'm depressed and whatever. And I just think the originals, some of the originals in here, while they sonically sound like the earlier stuff, I think they're a little deeper, which is yeah. great. And what I also love about this and what people bitch about 
is there's a lot of covers on here. And I'm okay with that because they built mm-hmm. their reputation as a band before they became famous as being a band that would play six or eight hours a night in bars in Hamburg playing, you know, American R&B and rock and roll covers. And to me, this really kind of pays homage to that. So yep. I put this ahead of Hard Day's Night. I put this ahead of Help. I, I absolutely love this. Most people think I'm crazy and think that this is a tired album. And I'm sure they absolutely were tired. But I just think this is an incredibly underrated album and the best of their early period, in my opinion. That's um, that album I associate the most with like a certain time in my life over any other Beatles record. Like, I remember like when I was getting into those albums in 2009 when the the George Martin remixes were coming out. Um, and that one specifically, I was going to the beach with my family um, in March or April. And I remember that was the album that I had bought and then downloaded onto my iPod and was listening to it. And like I just associate that with the beach and like that year, like two thousand it would have been two thousand ten, I guess, um, when I was listening to that. So my sophomore year of high school. And yeah, I mean like songs like like I'll follow the sun, um, even like Honey Don't, like I love yeah. that song. Yeah. Um, I love, you know, where George's like, you know, rock on, run time for Ringo, you know, like that sort of stuff. And um, I, th- I think maybe part of it is too is it was never released like this in North America until they standardized the CD catalog, really, in the 80s. So there's an entire portion of the world that didn't hear the album this way until, you know, 15 or 20 years later. And, and you know, it's not the way that they had heard it. The, they heard those songs the first time. So I think for a good portion of the market, I mean, it wasn't released like this in Canada either. So I think that maybe plays a part of it as well. But I just... Yeah. That's a great record. I, I, I also put it above Hard Day's Night. Oh, opinion. yeah. I To me, Hard Day's well, Night is a snooze. It's about right here, but it's definitely above Hard Day's Night for me, which a lot of people, like Glenn loves Hard Day's Night because it's all I can't Glenn stand and it. The, in, in my mind, the only the only Beatles album I like less is Yellow Submarine. <laughs> Yellow wow. Submarine and then Hard Day's Night. Yep. Rick, that's that's uh, a hot take. I don't like it. I just think it's very formulaic and boring, and it's the same as everything else that they'd put out. I think there's a lot of filler on Hard Day's Night, especially yeah. on the second side. I, I agree. But, um, but Rob, also, you don't really even like the Beatles, though, do you? Right. Oh, stop. I have more Beatles records than all three of you guys put together and multiply by some. So. Just, in, <laughs> just in Sergeant Pepper. <laughs> you get right. Exactly. Rob, 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 just give us your top three Beatles records. Go. Top three. Oh, Sergeant Pepper, Abbey Road, and the White Album. Yeah. 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 Good Easy. <laughs> all right. So... Uh, as yeah. Jeff said, yeah, yeah, people call it their tired album. And you know what? You can't blame the Beatles for being tired. I mean, they did more in a year than most of us do in five. So, I mean, hats off to them. James well, says, no. Beatles for well, Sale is a great sounding early Beatles album. I like Beatles 65, which is basically that album. It's George Martin's least favorite. I didn't know it was his least favorite. Mm-hmm. Steve says, I like Beatles for Sale. And I love With the Beatles, but that's more for sentimental reasons. Those who get a lot of flack, but they're both filled with great pop tunes. Yeah, I'm in a minority, but I'll take either of them over Revolver. Oh, wow. wow. Hot takes all around the yeah. night. Get, never. Get, <laughs> get the man some oven mitts. Jeff says, after Hard Day's Night, he goes for sale as an early go-to for me. My early go-to is still Please Please Me. That, that first album is just awesome. Robert Soul oh, also oh. knocked off very quickly. Yes, that's true. Now that I know Rob loves for sale, I may not bother picking it up. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, you know what they say: opinions are like buttholes. Everyone has one, and mine's probably not worth anything. So, I'm just some guy on YouTube. Your butthole? No, my opinion, not my butthole. My butthole is priceless. I need that. It keeps all the shit in. <laughs> Alex, this is not after dark. This is not the after. <laughs> Poor Side one of Beatles for Sale is the side. same as Beatles 65. Yes, Jeez. that's true. Okay. Uh, Beatles for Sale is the genesis of the White Album. Hmm. Hey, y'all. Happy Wednesday. Hey, Zach. Hey, Zach. Hey. I know that guy. Damn. Hey, brother. He goes, I'm just kidding. I own it. Perfect. All right. Round two. Sam. Damn. All right. Are you so, going to do Bob Dylan again? Keeping with uh, the Robert Zimmerman theme here, 
Yeah, I'm going to go. So, again, I talked about bringing it all back home. Obviously, he did Highway 61 and then Blonde on Blonde. So, like, his electric period. And then he started getting into, like, like he had, like, the so-called motorcycle accident, which I am still very hesitant as to whether or not he actually had a motorcycle accident. That's crazy. Um, I, I, I'm in the – Sam, a conspiracy theorist? I am not. I'm not at all a conspiracy no. theorist. I don't believe it. Crop a motorcycle accident, the earth is round and we did land on the moon, Sam. Alien Giant sand. steps are what you take walking on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so I would say for me, because again, like you have some, you have a few, I mean, like John Wesley Harding was kind of Dylan going back to like these, like, like kind of like the, the beginnings of Americana, like the pre band band kind of sound. Um, it was around the time that he was doing the basement tapes with those guys. But then fast forward to 1969, where he puts out this album, which is Nashville Skyline. It's Dylan's shortest album in his career. I think it's about 28 minutes long. He has this strange voice that is like this like sweet sounding voice. Like mm-hmm. I would say like as sweet as like something like Bosco. <laughs> you know, it's something, you know, awesome. as, as sweet as, you know, you know, something like that. Um, but apparently like he stopped smoking during this point. <laughs> and like just like had this like crooner voice, like it was just it was just this weird like it doesn't sound like Dylan. Like I played my cousin hates Bob Dylan, and I played him a song from this. I'm like I guess like who that cousin. is? And I'm like I'm like guess who this is? He's like I have no idea. I was like it's Bob Dylan. Well, I remember Sam. Not to interrupt you, but like um, interrupt. Have you all seen um Silver Linings Playbook? <laughs> no, it's yeah. on my list. Um, uh, great great movie. Love the movie, but they play um. Oh God! Well, I can't. Sorry, beers. Uh, the song he does with Johnny Cash, "Girlfriend North Country." Girlfriend North Country, which was part of an earlier record. It was on right? Freewheel in his second album. Yeah. Yep. Um, and and like I remember hearing that for the first time, and I was like, I thought it was like, do you remember when you first started downloading music on like LimeWire or Kazaa or whatever, and it would have the wrong artist because it was a stupid like pirate? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I heard it. I was like, this isn't Bob Dylan. Like, there's no way this is Bob Dylan singing this song. Right. Um, and and it, obviously, yeah, it's just, it was crazy. That I was like, there's no way this is Bob Dylan. Yeah. But I mean, cause, like the big hit on here was also, it was Lay Lay Delay, which is a top 40 hit. And like, you hear that song and he's got this like deep, like baritone voice. That, you know, again, he stopped smoking for four or five months, whatever it was. Um, and again, to go back to like the age thing, Bob Dylan in this picture is only 28. And like, this is already like like his ninth or tenth album, and it's like, how has this man like done so much? And he's like younger than me, like right now. Yeah. Like, what have I done with my life? Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, there's some great songs on here, like um, "Tonight I'll Be Staying Here with You," um, "To Be Alone with You." I threw it all away. Um, One more night, which Tony Rice covered later in the in the seventies or eighties. Um, just a fantastic record. I mean, it's produced by Bob Johnson, who, rec- who recorded a lot of those Nashville um, cats during that time of, um, you know, the recording history. Um, and like, like you said, Alex, like he's got like that great cover with Johnny Cash, Girl from North Country, where it was essentially just a jam session. And actually, when you listen to the version from this record, you can hear there's a um, there's a mistake that, you know, Dylan kind of screws up his own lyrics. And J- Cash is like singing the lyrics like louder mm-hmm. than Dylan is. But yeah, this is Dylan going country. It's a full-on country croon record. Um, he's got all the Nashville studio cats playing with him. Fantastic record at the time. I don't think it received a lot of a lot of love, but I I love this album. It's in my top five favorite Bob Dylan albums. Um, wow! And again. again, other than his other than his electric period, this is again. I would say this is like I mean, for me, this is like the second most drastic change, the most di- you know, diversive, um, divisive, whatever you want to say, um, period in Dylan's and Dylan's, uh, you know, history. I was, gonna, I was gonna tell you, I think I told you this the very first time I ever heard that song. I, I referenced Silver Lines Playbook because they play that song, uh, Girl from North Country. But, um, the first time I'd ever heard that song, Small World Moment, because I know Zach, my brother, is in the chat right now. Uh, first time I heard that song was somebody doing a cover version of it and a, a cover version that was n- by no means uh, replicative of the song itself, a very different interpretation of it. 
Um, but Counting Crows used to do like Ooh. a long-winded, extended sort of version of it. Oh, cool. um, and, you know, Adam Duritz from Counting Crows is a huge Dylan fan. So uh, that makes sense. But I remember seeing that live and like, I, I remember just, yeah, everything blowing me away. But yeah. Well, when, I, very- when I saw um, Crosby, Stills and Nash in 2014, they all had like their own like spotlight moment during the show. <laughs> and when Steven Stills had his part, he came out solo and he did Girl from the North Country by himself. Yeah. Beautiful song. See for me if my hair's hanging long. Yeah. Who is here? Hold on. All right, Jason. (laughs) Hold on. We got a couple comments here. James says he didn't like John Wesley Harding in Nashville Skyline until late 2010s. Loves him now. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Not Dylan, Sam. Paul's dead. Right. Yeah, that's why he was barefoot on Abbey Road. And hello to Catherine S. Hey, Catherine. All right. Jason, what do you got? Uh, Under the idea of polarizing artists i don't know if he's that polarizing but he's very he he was very uh you know like he was a drunken buffoon as the guy in almost famous said about jim morrison so we'll talk about the doors we'll talk about jim morrison and the doors being divisive is he divisive i don't know he's just he was just the epitome of a rock and roll alcoholic he was the drunken buffoon. I love him. Like this, this band, the Lizard King, if you will. Jason. The Lizard King and his band have been my number one band or my number top five favorite bands of all time, and will always be because it was the first band I ever got into hardcore, and it was the first band that I got into like on my own without any influence of other people. Oh, this is cool. I should start liking this. Right, the Doors yeah. were all me, and I found the Doors on my own, and it was uh, it was great, and the character of the lizard king like the fact that he is so out there and out of control was what drew me in it's like what the hell like i was i was pretty young i was pretty naive i was like 14 or 15 and like wow what's drugs you know like what like what what is this all about like what's an acid trip what's this like and i was i was just totally enamored with the idea of of a guy creating something while allegedly he's on something or if he's drunk like just he was my intro to to what that rock and roll star could be like, but he was still making music and still part of a band and still putting the time in and, and, and churning out, you know, with the exception, I think we talked about it last week, like the soft parade was kind of an odd one. And if I had the soft parade on vinyl, I probably like, I think I, have, I should have brought the CD down, but the soft parade was kind of like their album that didn't quite fit the mix. And, you know, we could talk about that sure. more later if we have to, but ultimately a device, a, a polarizing artist, Jim, simply because, some people I think later in the career and just got sick of him, just got sick of the guy. And, and, and he's not obviously not the only one. He is just yeah. one of many artists that got so messed up with, you know, substance abuse issues that he couldn't even function in the bloody studio. Right. Like, you know, he shows up drunk. He's got the, you know, I, I don't know. At the end of the day, the guy still was able to put out great albums and it sucks that he kind of put out that last album, which last week we talked about LA woman and how, great that could have been if they kept going that direction like go more blues go more blues it it sucks that he kind of he obviously burnt himself out and drank himself to death but yeah but jim's jim being a polarizing artist i think i think that's why it's because everyone loved him everyone loved the way he looked everyone loved the way he sounded everyone loved the story behind him and then he just let alcohol mainly alcohol get to him and get so far into the band that everything started to crack and, and everyone kind of felt, yeah, I, cheers to that. <laughs> everyone kind of, everyone kind of felt that it's everyone. My impression is he's polarizing because you, you wanted to love him, but you had to kind of hate him at the end because he had the talent. He had the band with the talent and they still had a lot of work to do. And the frigging idiot got just a little too far along in, in what can happen to anyone yeah. especially rock and roll artists and you kind of uh, you kind of feel bad about that i guess at the end of the day yeah i you know the only thing i would add there what i think that's a great a great pick jason um you know for me it was like i, I think the thing that makes the you know polarizing in, in addition to what you said about it was like he was known and still is known as like 
this amazing poet, right? It was the poet thing. And I think for me, when I first started listening to The Doors, I was like, oh, I like The Doors. I can get behind this, but I'm not really getting this poet thing. Like, I, 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 that, was, that was an aspect that I initially was not able to connect with. And still to this day, I don't know that I truly connect with. But I think that in one sense, like, put him on the pedestal of like, oh, he's not just a singer and a songwriter. Yeah, it, it's you almost know, like, like Ralph Waldo Emerson over here. You, you know, know and, and there's so many great, you know, skits and videos kind of making fun of people like Dylan and people like Morrison who put out lyrics that are so deep and that mo- the, like 90% of people don't actually either listen to them or don't actually like dive into fully understand them. And I'm totally guilty of a ton of artists, ton of music I love. If you ask me, for me to recite the song or to you know, give you the interpretation of the lyrics, you know, I'll probably fail on, on some level. And, sure. and Morrison is like that. And it's the poet aspect of it all, right? Like he was so, he was so well-read, you know, based on the stuff I read, he was yeah. very a well-read, educated dude and very artistic. And it came through in his lyrics. And he was, I guess you're right, Alex, like he was divisive in the sense that he was more of an intellectual than he was a rock star sometimes. Yep. Yeah, David Crosby. What's the story there, James? I'm not familiar with that take on that. I think Crosby just hated everybody. Oh, no, yeah. That may be a fair comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, right. yeah. He was like the get off my lawn kind of guy. He <clears throat> was. He was actually Glenn. Yeah. Yeah. A, wig, <laughs> a, long, a long wig. Yep. There you go. We would love to hear it. Glenn and David are the same in that way. You know, I like to say Glenn with a mustache like that. Yes. Mm. What do you got there, Alex? Rob, wake up. Um, <laughs> well, since Rob buried the lead before, I guess I'll go with him this time. So I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. For, for the long – no, it's perfect, actually. Uh, it was just the order in which they were stacked up. So for the people I who know me – I was teasing the audience, you see. And you are a tease, and we love that. Oh, you know. Uh, all of us. <laughs> uh, for those who have watched the show for a while or know me, uh, know that uh, I have a very special relationship with this band – uh, that has sold a bazillion records, but of those bazillion, probably about half a bazillion are due to one record that became very polarized, very polarizing for their fan base. And I'm curious what the what the nut gallery thinks of this whole thing, right? What the what the what, what the walnut or the what the pistachio, uh, you know, pistachio. Think. So you know, yeah, a band that puts out two out al- two early albums in 1980 and 1981 that were sort of a part of the new wave of British heavy metal. Uh, a minor hit, but nothing huge. Uh, they go into the studio. They replace them. They replace a member halfway through. They give Mutt Lang some more power in the studio, and he puts out one of the greatest hard rock slash pop sort of crossover albums in 1983 ever, called Pyromania. Uh, and then obviously they go on tour and blow up. And you know the story of I'm talking about Def Leppard, of course. You know the story that blows my mind is that. In 1983, after Pyromania was released, they went on tour, and at the beginning of the tour, they spent opening for Billy Squire, and three tour dates in to that tour, they switched the bill, and Billy Squire was opening up for Def Leppard on that tour, and absolutely blew up, but they actually didn't blow up uh, in Europe. They were so huge in America. A lot of stuff happened. Drummer loses an arm. They go through four producers. They go through all this stuff. Four years later, they sort of released what some people would call their magnum opus, their big pop record. I mean, this is, it still kind of blows my mind that this is one of the highest selling records of all time. I mean, this is up there. Yeah, it hasn't sold as much as like Thriller or Black and Black um, or anything like that. Beautiful. And these are, is that an original, Rob? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah I mean, they're not, I don't see these out much. Oh, I do. Which, yeah. Oh, well, you know, it's a Canada thing. Um, Maybe. But uh, it's so, I mean, this is a complicated record. I think polarizing because a lot of the classic hard rock fans who came in loving on through the night and high and dry, they probably saw the writing on the wall with Pyromania a little bit. But when this comes out, they're like, what is this? Are these, you know, drum machines and drum loops? And this, I mean, you know, pop songs. And what is this? And it's polarizing an interesting thing because, again, so many of those hard rock and metal fans were so turned off by this. I mean, completely lost them. But meanwhile, 
I mean, this thing has sold like 30 million albums in the U.S. alone. I mean, it's insane how much this record is sold. The thing that blows my mind about this record, and again, I think to understand this album is like understanding the history of between what made it. But the long, the long story short of it, this still blows my mind all the time. I remember seeing Phil Collin in an interview said they had to sell five million. They had to go quintuple platinum in the United States alone. Five million records, which is a shit ton of records. In the U.S. alone, simply to break even on this record. That's how much it cost to put it together, the three producers that they went through, the lost arm, all the different stuff. And so, I mean, yeah, this became the pop, hard rock, glam, whatever people want to call it, sort of crossover of 1987 that absolutely blew up. And they're still touring this album to this day. I mean, half their set list is coming from this album, and I love it. And so, totally polarizing, totally divisive. Love the band. I mean, they play such a, a strong role in my musical connection all the time. I also understand the classic rock uh, or the hard rock metal heads that can't stand this stuff. You were listening to Armageddon and excited, you know, excitable and all these different things and seeing where is my, you know, where's my high and dry. I totally get and understand that. But I mean, that's the point of this whole thing. It's interesting, right, Rob? I know you got some choices later where it's like you might turn off 10 people but a thousand more people are showing up to the door wanting more. And I think yep. that's the hard thing about art sometimes is that sometimes it does take turning off a lot of those early people to, to make you the money that you need to, to, to have this kind of career. So yeah, that's well, my second pick. I think Def Leppard's hysteria. So, I mean, it's no secret. I love that album too. And I love Def Leppard. I mean, we've talked about this numerous times. I think maybe part of the objection to that album, I think is, We'll call them the Def Leppard purists, the people that were there from the beginning. Kind of went, ah, they sold out, whatever. But who's to say that the band sold out, you know, to become commercial, to be successful? Or maybe that just happened to be the record that they wanted to make. I mean, yeah. only the band themselves could say, right? So, you know, yeah. I, I, I can kind of understand. There's bands that I like that have changed directions. And I went, yeah, no, I got to get off the train here. I mean, a, a great example for me, I'm a huge fan of Grace Potter and the Nocturnals. When she went solo, still the same singer, still the same songwriter. I think her solo stuff is shit. And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm not interested anymore. So I could, I could see how the original Def Leppard fans would go, yeah, this ain't my cup of tea anymore. But, <clears throat> you know, you can't fault the band for necessarily, you know, selling out. And I think there's also – there is a big segment of the music consumption fan base that as soon as something's successful or commercial, well, it's not any good anymore. It's selling, it's selling there's anything out. wrong with this album. It's a fucking great record. Yeah. Oh, and you, I mean, you can see the comments are eating it. Uh, comments are tearing it apart, which I, I mean, I totally get. Um, Let me get this. You know, I don't think the YouTube watch uh, party is indicative of like, you know, the general music fan. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting you know, if, if you know the history of Def Leppard and the, the writers, the main songwriters is they grew up on things like David Bowie and T-Rex and Sweet and Mott the Hoople. And Hysteria is more indicative of the early, early 70s glam stuff. I mean, the whole song Rocket is based on that those early influences. What happened yeah. was they did those hard rock records in the early 80s and people thought that they sounded that they were influenced by Iron Maiden and ACDC and they're like no we love Bowie. <laughs> like so that, let, you know, let me let me pose a question here. So the, the example that people always give is pour some sugar on me is a shitty song because it's superficial and it's not about anything and whatever. Point take it. That's I mean I love that song but you're right there's not it's a superficial song. But everyone reaps praise on Kiss, and you're telling me something like "fucking Love Gun" is any better? Fuck off! That's yeah, yeah I, think, I, I don't know. If there was a question there, but, you're right. but the point is, if you enjoy them, who gives a shit? Yeah, pardon my yeah. French. Well, I, mean, I got to stop swearing because we're not supposed to swear. Yeah, well, and you know, the, the history was the hysteria was a. I mean, that's why hysteria as the record is 63 minutes long. Pour Some Sugar On Me was the late ad. The record was done at 55 minutes or whatever it was, 57 minutes. And then Hysteria was the late ad and, of course, blew them away. 
That's we big. Got a Jack, young Jack out here. He Jack, you're one of my most hated YouTubers, man. So why don't you? <laughs> that out, Everyone unsubscribe from Jack. Jack, why, look out. Why don't you I'm become kidding. an adult, Jack? You Listen to the 18 year old kid. More like jerk the music guy. <laughs> We're kidding, Jack. We love you, man. I like Pyromania better than a steer. I love them both. Yeah. They're different. What about the records, though? Uh, Def Leppard to two gallons, their debut. Uh, on through the night and high and dry. Then they sold their soul. Well, that's yeah, maybe. Some, some people got to make money. Maybe. I'm mean, at the reality, too. <laughs> Is that you know the bands like that? Yeah, of course. I love those two records, but like if they were gonna, they would not have been a band. They would have died out after three years and never made any money, and would have went back to the Spoon Factory. But does it? I mean, a lot of good bands that have stood the test of time have changed their style. Look at the music. I'll go back to my example. Look at the musical evolution the Beatles made in seven years. Look at yeah. the style changes that U two's gone through through twenty years. Look at the style changes the Rolling Stones have made over the decades. Yeah. You can't make the same record over and over well, and over. One and of eight. my favorite groups, um, and Alex will back me up on this, and it, it's, they're one of his favorite groups too, I'd say, is The Head and the Heart. I mean, we've talked about them numerous times. Their first two records are straight ahead indie folk. I mean, just you know, acoustic guitars, a couple of you know, electric instruments, and then they go full on like indie pop. I mean, like just like full on like electric instruments, you know, drum machine kind of sounds, um, maybe some like hints, maybe slight hints of hip hop. Um, I know, I know Steve in the comments, he bought their latest album per my recommendation, every shade of blue <laughs> per um, <my> recommendation, <laughs> but like, I mean, like a group like that, like, and like, if I, if I didn't decide to focus fully on Dylan, like I would have definitely brought up the head and the heart because like, they are so different or like Mumford and Sons for even like a bigger group. They like those first two records are almost identical to one another. And like the acoustic, you know, like banjos kind of thing. And then they kind of did the same thing as Head in the Heart, where they went like electric instruments and like a lot of computer generated stuff. For me, it worked for the Head in the Heart, but it didn't work for Mumford and Sons. And that's what's so interesting about music. Cause like I love those first two Mumford and Sons records. But then once they started getting into like what was like The Wolves or whatever the album was, um, like I was like, I can't do it. Like I can't get into it. But the Head in the Heart, I was like, yeah, I can, I can get behind this. So it's, it's just, it's all about preference. Steve says they're apparently Abbey Road's coming out with a half speed master later this year. So I'd be interested. In, I'm not an audiophile, but that might be that'd be one album. I, 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 that's, a, that's my second favorite album of all time. Like, I feel like I would have to get that. Really? And you're, uh, you're talking me out of a small batch today. I did, but you hate that album, so it's fine. No, it's not true. Westman, <laughs> you, Westman if you're still there, are you going to get that? Uh, that small batch of uh, he probably West been going to get it for free. What are you talking about, Jason? Uh, right. Steve, are you getting it for free? Can I have one? The, 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 this could be a whole chat right here all together, so we'll answer this later on. Best stripper <laughs> song ever, Alex. What? Let's table that for the after show. Oh, oh my Rob, how many God. times Great have you stripped? Idea, here? Um, I haven't stripped <laughs> any songs, but you know, oh, well, I, 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 I may have Oops. attended a strip club once or twice or <clears throat> a thousand times. Yeah. In a day, <laughs> Mutt took Def Leppard in a, in that direction. He did, and, and my my quick comment because a lot of people don't recognize it, Mutt produced High and Dry too. So a lot of people think that Mutt came in on Pyromania and made him a pop rock band, but Mutt also produced High and Dry. Yep, obviously very different albums later on. But yeah, I mean he was coming from Foreigner and from Back in Black and Highway to Hell. I mean, yep, Mutt ha knew how to make a record and make some money, and he was a great songwriter. Damn right. Love Bites originally was supposed to be a rocker and yep. turned it into, into a ballad. Yeah, the country, it was a country song. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear the taste of it there, Alex. Well, the, the so the intro riff that we all know is like that. Da -da 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 but he originally had it as like a, <laughs> a, like a finger picking like acoustic song, like the, hmm. you know, the, you know, sort of thing. You got that Jack Black thing going on where you can like, I'm, try <laughs> you know, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. <laughs> I love it. I, love it. I, oh, I, I want to hear you sing your other song, Alex. Maybe we'll say that for the after show. <laughs> He's going to get a beer. He <laughs> was off the drinky away. Archie Sugar. Oh, Horse of Sugar on me was inspired by the Archie Sugar Sugar. I have heard that, yes. They would have kept being a killer hard rock band. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. You can play the what if game. I don't know. Maybe. 
Bring it on the heartache is pretty much pop rock. <laughs> Here it is. I, I saw Joe Elliott open think, for Mott, but... and there may be no bigger Mott fan than him. Even as a side project he does. Uh, yeah, because cool. remember when, when they were inducted into the Hall of Fame, I think that – um, um, what's his name? Shoot. One's, I mean, uh, Steve's going to hate me. Ian Hunter, he came out and did all the young dudes, and, like, Joe Elliott was there and, like, all those guys. Uh, Colin Blundstone, because the zombies were inducted that year too, they all came out and did all the young dudes and then sang the song. I don't know what strip club you're going to, John, but – <laughs> that, that's a very depressing <laughs> good lord my turn now all right well they're all kind of depressing but yes. so uh the band i'm going to talk i'm going to talk about an album but the band that I, that put out this album would also maybe be considered divisive because there's a lot of people that um it's not cool to like this band there's a lot of people that say ah their best music was in the first 10 years of their career and there's a lot of people that will say there was one record that broke me and I, I couldn't follow them anymore. For all those reasons, I'm going to talk about Pop by U2. Interesting. I mean, yes. I, I, I'm a Disco huge U2 fan. I love U2. Um, it, it granted, U2 in the 80s is a much, much different band than U2 in the 2000s and U2 now. Even though it's the same people, they are, you know, it's a, a substantial musical evolution. But I think for a lot of folks, pop was kind of the, the sort of the demarcation point where a lot of people went, uh uh, I'm, I'm done. And I, 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 I get it because this, you know, you're coming from that, that awesome late 80s stuff like Joshua Tree, right? And then, some of that really cool early 90s Octung Baby is awesome. Masterpiece. I love that album. Yeah. And then you've got Zeropa. I personally hate Zeropa, can't stand it, but I get why people think it's an incredible album and it's a great follow up to Octung Baby. And then they put out this, which is there's a lot of dancey, techno y shit in here. Disco um, Tech was the first single, wasn't it? Right, exactly. I was like, holy wow. shit, what is this? And and if you remember the tour from this, they had that the big arch with the the friggin' disco it ball. It was a and huge they, production. Like massive. That that concert was incredible. I didn't, I wasn't at it, but I have several bootlegs from several uh, stops in that tour. Incredible show, but it was almost style over substance. And I mean, this is an album that, I mean, I'm a U2 completist. I have everything, and half of this album I love. And half of this album, I hate. There's some incredible songs in here, like Last Night on Earth, uh, If God Will Send His Angels Staring at the Side. Like, there's some stuff on here I really love. There's some other shit on here I hate. Don't like discotheque. Um, don't like mofo. You know, there's... <laughs> so, How could you not like mofo? Eh, you know, whatever. So definitely an album that a lot of people went, yeah... And I, if I remember correctly, when they when they launched this, it was it was like at a Walmart or something because it was sort of their their comment on the, their social comment on the commercialization of music or some bullshit. I don't know. Hey, listen, Bono is awfully full of himself, which is another thing that puts a lot of people off you too. You just want to say Bono, you're one of the richest men in the world, and you're talking about poverty. Shut up and just <laughs> write some songs. I love you too, but Bono gets on my nerves too. So I can really see why a lot of folks got, ah, I'm done with this band after this. I, I I have this and I listen to it occasionally. I loved the tour that accompanied this album and I loved what they put out after this. I mean, um, uh, the album after this was uh, All That You Can't Leave Behind, which was yeah. great. And then, you know, how to dismantle an atomic bomb and no line in the horizon. I love those albums. So this was kind of like a one off. It was different than the stuff before it. And it was different than the stuff after it. So I get why this kind of turns some folks off you too. Well, I, so my question for you, Rob. Is, yeah. So because you two, I, I had Rattle and Hum pulled A because I just did a video and I showed Rattle and Hum. 
not because rattle and hum's divisive, but a U2's become a very polarizing band. Um, my question for you is, was it always that way? Or is that what you showed with pop? Does that sort of start it? Like, I know so much of that is connected to people like Bono and obviously his role in society. Um, but but I've, I've said to you before, I love you two. And they've also sort of become like the band that's cool to hate, right? Right. And so like, is that a new-ish thing? Or was that something that was kind of going on back in those days too? I don't know. Um, I don't seem to remember the hate 25 years ago when this came out. I remember 25 years ago, people were like, this album's weird. But mm-hmm. I don't remember people, you know, saying, it's not cool like you too, you too sucks. And maybe that's because the internet wasn't a thing like it is. I mean, it existed, but it, we're talking 2000, not a lot of people. Dial up tones. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. I think maybe it's just, uh, I think it's a newer thing. I don't know. I, I don't really know where that comes from. But I do remember at the time, a lot of critics went, ah, yeah. YouTube lost their marbles on this one. Um, I wonder if it had to do with the, like the Coldplay resurgence, because I know Chris Martin from Coldplay was always saying that they wanted to be the next U2. And I, I give a lot of props to, to Coldplay. And the reason I do is because they, they've kind of gone through a similar arc as U2, mm-hmm. where like a lot of their albums recently have been like very popular. Like they've relied so much on like, you know, like Beyonce or people that have come in to like do duets or whatever. But at their core, you go see Coldplay Live, it's just those four guys, just like you two. Yep. And I have a lot of respect for that. Even oh, me too. Their last three or four albums are crap, whatever you want to think. I don't want to bash them because I, I like a lot of Coldplay. Um, but it's the same four guys. So I don't know if we've ever talked about Coldplay, but I would I go to bat for those four, first four Coldplay records. Mm. I love each and every one of them. Then they lose me. But still, like everything from Parachutes to Viva La Vida, I am all in on. Well, I mean, I, I, I played the song um, from their album. Um, what's the most, not the most recent one, but the one before that that came out there in COVID. Um, I did their song Broken um, live sometimes. Yeah. Jack's saying on here, War is fantastic. I mean, yeah, everyone loves those early U2 albums. I mean, that's, I, I don't think you're ever going to find a U2 fan that says, I like the modern stuff and I hate the early stuff. I think yep. the early stuff yeah. is universally loved by anyone that likes U2. Yeah. The reverse is, is not true. I mean, a lot of people like the early stuff and don't like the modern stuff. And again, I think pop is probably that that dividing line that a lot of people said, you know, I'm done. It, it felt like their, their career took a total shift at that point. Like it was like a shift, not shit, a, a shift. Like it was shift, like, yes. we, we've, we've done everything we can artistically. Now let's get more political and, you know, different. And I think that's like the same with any artist. It's like eventually you were just run out of your creative ability based on, the energy that came with the band as it developed. And then you're like, okay, we've hit that point and now we have to figure out how we're going to develop a new sound and or a new message, which usually involves some kind of stance on politics, hence Bono with the, you know, all that kind of stuff. You make a very interesting point. And 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 it happens. I I will agree. You look at, so the album after this was all that you can't leave behind. It's that black and white covered one with them in the airport in Paris. If you look at that and you look at the last album they did, which was um, Songs of Experience, take the acoustic remix shit they did. Don't ignore that. Because <laughs> yeah. that's that's not a studio album. That's just them being bored. But all the studio albums, while I love them all, there's not much of a progression from All That You Can't Leave Behind all the way up through Songs of Experience. They're all kind of similar. Um, safe well they've they've kind of found a sound and I love the sound don't get me wrong but it doesn't it doesn't take you on the ride like their first you know five or six albums I mean look at the difference yeah. between you know uh, War and October and you compare that with with Octung Baby which was only 10 or 12 years later huge difference so you don't see that but I think I, when I think of you two, 
I think of them as a concert band because mm-hmm. they're still playing today. The same four guys. I mean, right now Larry's had back surgery, so he's got a temporary fill in. The same four guys, which is awesome. And they're still playing those songs from 40 years ago. And they still put on one of the best live shows I've ever seen. In every show, they try to outdo themselves and and do something different. Like they did the U2 360 tour, which was in the round. And what a cool stage setup. And on the Songs of Innocence, they had like this big, long stage with this giant video wall that dropped down. So you couldn't see the audience on the other side, but there was this huge video. They just think of creative ways to perform those same songs live year after year. And yeah, I never get bored of seeing them done live. So do you guys think that, I guess this is kind of like a, you can't really answer this, I guess, because none of us are superstar artists, maybe Sam is, or he's the closest one to it. Like, you know, the Rolling Stones playing Start Me Up, you know, Pearl Jam for me, like they play a live or even flow every show. Like, do you think a band just gets so sick and tired or, or is it just more it comes in waves? Hey, sometimes I like playing this song. Or is there a duty to play the hits? And how, how does that how does that make a band feel? Like, do they? Well, I always I always felt bad when a band goes on tour for a new album and you're sitting you're playing in front of ten to twenty thousand people and they only want to hear the shit from like five, ten, fifteen years ago. So I I can answer that not because I'm I'm, I'm not a musician, <laughs> but I asked that very same question to my pal Bob who played in blue rodeo for 17 years i said do you not get bored of playing try every yeah. single what did he show say? and he goes no i don't because people love it and it's the reason people come to the shows people come to the shows we still have fans mm-hmm. it was that's our job and if they're if they love hearing yeah. it we play it well, that's what that's what Mick, Mickey Dolan says that about the monkeys. Like they they have like a there was a set number of songs that they knew that they had to do. Like they had to do Daydream Believer. They had to do Clarksville, Lost Train in Clarksville. They had to do um, Pleasant Valley Sunday. They said if we knock out like there was like six songs, like whatever it is, we can do whatever we want. And I think like even like someone like Paul McCartney could do that. Like if Paul McCartney, I mean obviously he's like at a different level, but if Paul McCartney did like Hey Jude. You know, sorry, Rob. Yesterday, band on the run. Um, you know, like those types of songs, like you know, Eleanor Rigby. People would like leave happy if he did those six songs, and then did stuff like that, like the deep cuts from you know, like the Wings back catalog or whatever. People would still leave like, okay, that that, that was a pretty solid show because he did like all these hits. But obviously, we know like you know, someone like Paul McCartney, he can do 20, 25 hits. 30 hits and not even touch the back catalog. And even like to an extent, like the monkeys, even though like they weren't around for that long, they could do 10 or 12 songs that are all solid hits that are still put on the radio. But if they do those certain songs, no matter what the band is, the audience is going to leave somewhat happy. They, they might leave like, Oh, you know, he didn't do blah, 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 but you know, he still did this, this, and this. I think it also probably depends on the musician too. I'm sure there are some that, that hate playing the same song, yeah. Four thousand times. But, I guess it depends on the person. Yeah, but you're right, Rob. Like maybe John Mellencamp hates stuff like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. He's I a think, bit of I a curmudgeonly it... bastard, though. <laughs> nah, I love him. <laughs> like, yeah, like a lot of us. I think you're right, though. Like maybe it's the right thing to do is to view it as like it's the job, you know. And you know, sometimes you go to your job and you perform the same task every day, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. But you know that's what the job demands, and you just do it. I just hope that I guess the the, the fanboy in me is hoping that when I watch my favorite band play, they actually get into it. And you never, you'll never know. You know, they can easily put on a show. No pun intended. Like they can easily put on airs and pretend that they're loving it. I guess you always, as a fan of music, you want to believe that when you see it live, it matters to them still. And I guess I want to live in that world of of being naive in that sense. Marsha corrected me. You two announced the tour at a Kmart store. That's right. Same what? idea, though. You, yeah. got them up, you got them up there in Canada? We did back then. Not anymore. Yeah. Long I don't gone. even know if they exist anymore. Period. They Long are. gone. The one around here went bye-bye. Right. Brandon says, I remember liking the second staring single the from Pop, yeah. Staring at the Sun. Yeah, I loved it. That was a regular rotation MTV or Much Music up here in Canada. It yeah, was, it was a great video. 
Definitely more welcome than Disco Tech for sure. Oh. I have the 12 inch single for Disco Tech. I never play it, but I, because I'm a U2 completist and I got it for like $3. I'm like, yeah, okay. Octane Baby was the last one I bought. And there's a lot of people like that that said, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm when they heard Zuropa, they're like, I'm done. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that was an interesting period. I love Octane Baby. That That's a fantastic album. Bono became a parody of himself. Yeah, you know what? There's a lot of people who think he's full of hot air, and I'm one of them. I love the songs that he writes. I love seeing him perform songs. But a lot of times when he's doing his, uh, like, listen, I, I'm, I'm all for supporting causes and whatever, but Bono can get a little bit much, and he goes, dude, can you just stop talking? All That You Can't Leave Mine from 2000s record. I, like, I love that record. Absolutely. I saw them on that tour. It was great. You did, eh? Wow. Uh, let's see if I'm missing any more here. That are on topic. I saw this Europa concert in France. We kept wondering if the East Coast German Travi car saying will come crashing. <laughs> yeah, they had this like car suspended from the from oh, the wow. stage. My best friend, who's also he's the biggest YouTube fan I know, or YouTube fan that I know, and he and I have been to see you two together. He saw them on Zeropa and said it was just an incredible show. I don't like that tour because Bono had this character that he would get in that he would portray called McFisto, and he had these stupid devil horns and sunglasses. And I'm just like, what is this? Because he's such a he's such a badass, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's there's great front men, and then there's okay front men, and then there's Bono, who I don't know where he lies, but <laughs> well, and James says here, Rattling Hum was the start of the YouTube backlash. Mm. Uh, I almost talked about Rattling Hum because it's my favorite. I know Marsha hates it, but she can be wrong. That's my favorite too, and I won't let her come on to defend herself because it's my stream tonight, Marsha, and you're wrong, and I'm right about Rattling. This is the boys Hum. in the basement. But, you know, there's a lot of people that say that album was, was ill-conceived or poorly executed because it's half live and it's half studio and it's kind of a hodgepodge. I get all that. I embrace all that and I still love it. But, yeah, there are a lot of folks that say the beginning of the end for U2 was rattling up. Agreed. He says, I saw U2 three times in the 80s. Oh, right in the early days. Wow. Never purchased another one after Octane Baby and Zeropa. Right. I, as I've said, there's a lot of folks that fall into that category. I'm going to skip through the rest of this, or we're going to be talking about you two <laughs> all night, and people are going to get bored of talking about you two. I want to hear from Jason. It's a lot. All of right. Me. Sam. Sam. Or, um, he's probably going to talk about Bob Dylan. I am. I'm gonna talk about Bob Dylan. Oh, I'm gonna go fill my water. Bob Dylan. Have another, have another drink, Sam. Come on, I'm gonna go get some more ass tea, Alex. Fuck it up. Um, what's funny is that you have, <laughs> you have. I just talked about Nashville Skyline, which was 1969. It's crazy that Dylan went to 1970 with another polarizing album. Which somebody mentioned this in the comments earlier um, with Self Portrait and Rolling Stone had like the infamous you know, review on this album um, because it's essentially just like a ton of covers and like alternate, like new versions of old songs. Like he does a version of She Belongs With Me, but he also does like The Boxer by Simon and Garfunkel. He does um, Early Morning Rain by Gordon Lightfoot. Um, he does, there's a few songs from like the Isle of Wight um, live show that he did with the band. But at that show, you had people like Yoko and John and George Harrison were all in the audience um, during that show. Cause it was like Dylan's first show since the 66 tour with the band. And over time, this album has really like picked up like a lot of love because like the, there was a bootleg series that came out under Dylan's um, under Columbia records called another self portrait. And again, this album, you have a mix of like that Dylan, like crooning voice still from like the Nashville skyline era with like that smooth, country boys um but you also have stuff on here from like the basement tape sessions like the mighty quinn which man for man did um had a big hit with it um songs like minstrel boy um wigwam um let's see bell isle which is like an old folk tune um days of 49 which is a great song about the gold rush in california 
So it's interesting that he decided to go this route. And I think, I think over time it's been discovered that like Dylan, is, Dylan made this album intentionally bad, but I don't think it's a bad album. I think it's, I, I like it a lot because like the, the first song is interesting. It's called all the tired horses. And it's like, it's these female vocalists that sing all the tired horses in the sun. How am I supposed to get any riding done? But the way that they sing it, you're like, are they saying writing or are they saying writing? And so it's supposed to be like, like maybe it's like Dylan proving a point. Like, he, you know, he's tired of being, you know, the so-called voice of a generation. He's tired of, you know, he did that, that extensive tour in 66 with the band where he got booed so much. And, you know, he had done the basement tapes in 67. Um, So there's a lot of like potential, like what ifs with this album. Again, produced by Bob Johnston, who did um, Nashville Skyline. I like the album. Again, it's 24 tracks. Um, A lot of them are covers. A lot of them are alternate versions of older Dylan songs. Um, A lot of them are traditional folk tunes. But again, very polarizing. Rolling Stone hated it. Um, so I mean, but again, I love it. Um, the the album cover was was painted by Bob. Um, I just I, I, the I album I, cover I, that album cover polarizing as hell. It is. Uh, yep. It, Gotta it say is. that's that's not that's that's something on my fridge right now that my uh, kid did ten years ago. I thought it was a photograph he took of himself. It, 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 it's all of the above. It's Jason's kid, who's also Bob Dylan, that he took a selfie of himself. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I love self portrait. Um, again, it's crazy that it came out just a year after Nashville it's Skyline. So horrible for you, I'm sorry, Bob. I love you, man. But that's a bad freaking image. <laughs> so, cheers. There's my uh, there's a, my next four record. There's a picture just like it on his fridge that his kid drew ten years ago. <laughs> What's funny is this kid is only nine. (laughs) Fresh out of the womb, drew that. (laughs) All right, Jason, talk to us. Okay. (laughs) How many beers in are you, Jason? (laughs) Uh, Four. (laughs) Okay. Oh, there you go. I got an album cover. (laughs) <laughs> looks the same. Jeez, Rob. That's there's there's your there's your cover for the stream, Rob. And you repost. You know what? I I should sell T-shirts with this on it, and then that's the, the revolution logo. logo. That's the thumbnail of this stream. Is that picture? Oh, please, please do that for now. <laughs> Let me know in the comments if you want me to make this into a T-shirt. Yes, I will buy it. Dude, we should all we should, you should make those just for like the the guys on the stream. We all wear them like next we're like you know next month or whatever. <laughs> Jason's wetting himself over there. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right, uh, good, good. My turn. You hold go on one second. Comments. I got a couple comments yeah, yeah. here. Go for it. Just I stand up. corrected, Marsha. You, but you are right, Marsha. It is kind of poorly laid out, but I still love Rylan Hill. Okay. Uh, Self Portrait is one of my top Bob albums. Wow. Okay. Days of 49 is also one of my top Dylan songs. Dang, Jack. Yeah, that's a great song. Incredible vocals, I don't believe. In the days right. of old, in the days of old, it's the days of like old. Shit and razor blades. The 1970 50th anniversary collection has some great self-portrait outtakes. Yeah, that was an interesting. That was an interesting release, James. I'm not best picture. Thanks, Joel. All yeah, right, Jason, awesome here. Best picture. Oh, okay. So I wish uh, I wish uh, Vance was here from Zep Pearl because I'm talking about Pearl Jam here, and it was the first and only real example that I thought fit this stream really good. And this is their uh, their fourth album called No Code. Um. If you know Pearl Jam, you know the album. Uh, and if you know Pearl Jam, this may have been the album that you just stopped giving a shit about Pearl Jam. Um, just by the nature of my age and getting into music, this is the album that came out when I started following Pearl Jam. What if we never gave a shit from the beginning? Uh, uh, well, I'm just going to put my hand over your portion of the screen. Here. Um so this was the big one for them that they lost a lot of fans. They did 10, obviously huge versus critically even better than 10, they say. 
and, and still huge. Vitology came out. They're touring for Vitology when they're kind of they're touring for Vitology and they were trying to make this album at the same time. And they, they, they went in the early years, they went through their whole drummer thing where they're trying to find different drummers that fit the band. So who do they get? They get Jack Irons to step in as drummer for this. And I thought that the Jack Irons contribution on this album was very super cool. A lot of rhythmic sort of beats and very uh, just different than what you would expect from the earlier Pearl Jam, which is more of a stadium rock. They say that this is more of a garage rock type of thing. I don't really understand that per se, but there was a lot of critical... Um, they didn't like this album. People didn't like this album. The fans hated the album. The fans started the, the, they lost some fans for sure. What they've retained is, you know, commendable. And people always say the same thing about Pearl Jam is they have a very passionate fan base, but they lost a lot of fans after this one. Mm -hmm. They're on tour with, for the Vitology album. They're trying to build an album. They're also battling Ticketmaster at this point. So they're losing a hell of a lot of, um, clout except for the diehards that are just you know anti-establishment let's fight the man Ticketmaster stuff they ultimately like you know had a bit of egg on their face because their their bout with Ticketmaster didn't like go anywhere um though i appreciate you know the sentiment and the effort for sure but they you know and then on top of all that the band isn't getting along at this point whether that's related to the Ticketmaster stuff and all the stress that comes with that this is the album that's like Okay, Eddie's in charge here. Eddie's going to call the shots, and guys started to not like that a little bit. Or I think uh, I think Jeff, the bass player, was kind of the most put off by it. But I could be wrong on some of this. But ultimately, in the studio, the notes about this album suggest that it wasn't their best time. However, the end product, depending on who you ask, was actually really good. I thought this was great because, yes, it was very different than the other stuff. And one of the critics, one of the more common criticisms of the album was it wasn't as good of a piece entirely together. I didn't really get that. I thought because Jack Irons kind of tied everything together with his drumming, that it kind of fit as a, as, as a piece. Um, it's pro it's my, if it's not my, it's, it's always top three for me for their albums. If it's not top two, um, I wow. don't know. Like, y Yield came after this and those two always battle it out. 10 is kind of hard, you know, it's hard to touch 10. 10 is pretty damn freaking awesome, but I love this album. This is one wow. of my favorites when I had the opportunity to buy. This is a two, 2021 reissue. Um, it's it's great. I'd like to have originals of all Pearl Jam stuff, but that's a lot of money, and I don't really, don't really need that. It's more of a, a wish list, not a want list. But, um, but this whole era of the band, you know, they were losing fans. They were fighting with each other. They didn't really have a, a, a drummer per se, you know, they, they were kind of like borrowing Jack Irons, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers had them for a bit. Um, <laughs> but they put out so much material around this era that didn't even get on the album. I actually looked it up just to double check and like songs. And if you're, if anyone's watching, that's a Pearl Jam fan, they'll know like, you know, Black, Red, Yellow, Dead Man, Leaving Here, the song All Night is just the song All Night by Pearl Jam. Like if anyone, anyone gives a shit about Pearl Jam, I'll tell you this. After the stream is over, actually after Alex's stream is over, there is a, an amazing performance of the band of the song "All Night" that Pearl Jam does with the band The Roots on the Jimmy Fallon show. That I would encourage everyone wow. to go search that out. Jimmy Fallon, Pearl Jam, "All Night." The Roots kind of chime in. It is next level shit. It's really good. Anyway, so talk about an album that divided the fan base. This is the one. They lost a shit ton of fans. Um, and I totally understand why I get it, but I just happen to be of the vintage that came into this band at the right time that it didn't matter to me. Right. Almost like Dylan, where Dylan had a sound, Dylan left that sound. A bunch of fans just jumped off. Right. Pearl Jam had a sound. Pearl Jam left that sound. All the fans jump off. And that's the same for a lot of bands, right? The longer you last, the more you need to reinvent yourself. Just like you too. Right. Like where do we go from here? What do we do? And then you're naturally going to lose some people. But this was pretty much a textbook example of let's release an album and then half the people hated it and they jumped off. So that's my thoughts on No Code, Pearl Jam, 1996. James says that's the album where he got off the Pearl Jam train, but he came back for their self-titled. Yep. Pretty common, yeah. I kind of started going off Pearl Jam with No Code. 
Yeah, it's it's it's. I'm in the minority where I say I love that album. Most people are like, yeah, I was out. That was it. Too bad. What did you think, Jason? Like the song, like Dance of the Clairvoyance, or whatever it was. I heard that, and I was like, damn it, I don't want to. Like, obviously, like that's my number one band. I've lost all objectivity. Like they can't do no wrong by me. Dance of the Clairvoyance. When I first heard it, I was my reaction was I'm worried for the band <laughs> because it was so weird and kind of like like drum machine shit. I'm like, yeah. this is not what I like, but it grew on me. Did it grow on me because it was good or did it grow on me? Cause I just want to like everything they do. Probably the latter. Um, but I don't turn it off when it comes on. Yeah. They, they play that all the time. Like I, I talked about, you know, the spectrum on, on Sirius XM. They play yep. that song all the time. Like that was like the single that they were pushing. On that channel. I do it. I, I do admire bands, you know, and like, again, any band that's been around for, you know, more than a decade or more than 10 albums, whatever. I do like that they try. They try to reinvent themselves. And I really appreciate it if they try and they're a, a more vintage, older band. If you're trying on your second and third album, then you, you know you haven't put your time in to kind of earn and deserve your fan base. If you've been around for, you know, this is 1996, so they're only about six years into their career and they kind of deviate and do something different. It's a, it's a bit more of a risk and it's harder to gain respect. If you're U2, like how many years was U2 around when they released Pop? Uh, about almost 20. Yeah, like at that point, like kudos to them. They're just like, you know, we've been around. We put our time in. We're going to put this shit out. You like it or love it. Here it is, right? Um, Pearl Jam, that was way more of a risk for them. They took a big risk on that one. Um, and when um, the song you, Dance of the Clairvoyance came out on that album, that was later career. They're trying to do something different. How could you not try to do something different, right? Like that's right. Anyway, I'm just ranting now. Pearl Jam sings the song that I hate more than any other song in the history of the world. Oh my God! What song? Last Kiss. They covered it. Where, they covered it. where could my baby I mean, be? I hate the, I hate the J. Frank Wilson original, but I hate the Pearl Jam one even more. I love that song. I, but Rob, I love the Taylor Swift hit. version. Thank you. The Lord took her away from Sam, me. I'll boot you off this stream right it's now. so sad. At least the Pearl yeah, I'm going to take version, Sam off the stream right now. At least Pearl Jam's version is more in line with the lyrics. Like, true. the original version is, like, very poppy. I'm like, are you listening That's to true. the lyrics? It does not match with the It's music. a horrible. Like, the lyrics are just a guy yes. holding his dying woman in his arms, for God's yes. sake. It should be a sad-ass song. <sighs> Hell yeah. All right. There's my Pearl Jam moment for the night. Thanks, everyone. There's Richie. Dance. Yield Dance is one of Pearl Jam's best. Mm -hmm. What's John have to say? Jason, I would never want to burst your bubble, so please don't read this comment. All right. And he, and... <laughs> I need to re-listen to Unforgettable Fire. Yeah, you do. Good record. Finalology had some different stuff on it. Yeah, you're right, James. I thought there was some weird stuff on that. And to per, like Pearl Jam, I admit, a lot of bands do that. There's always one song on the album that's like, whoa, what the hell? It's like they just threw that in there to be experimental. I don't really like that stuff, but whatever. Bug, stupid mop. Yeah, exactly. A to Z. All right, Alex. Uh, you're All right, so for this next one, I'm going to do a little bit of a double shot. They're two different bands, but I think in a way, kind of, they both tie in in, in this way that, and this is sort of shooting off a little bit of the, the hysteria thing, but, you know, it's tough, right? Because it, it's like, you could argue that some of the greatest, most popular, greatest selling albums of all time were probably a little bit divisive for the fan base, especially that original fan base, right? Like, I wasn't alive at the time, but if I grew up a, I'm not going to show this record, but if I grew up a Bon Scott worshiper and that era of ACDC meant everything to me, I would have heard Back in Black and been like, that's not my band, right? Like, and I'm curious, I, that was not my area, but I could understand why people would feel that way. So these are two bands that are not related at all. We're talking similar time frame of the mid 80s here that both experience some incredible commercial success, but I think there might be questions about how strong these records actually are. So the first one I'll start with is a band that I have the utmost respect and appreciation for. You know, they put out, I guess, six records, all most of which are incredible. This is commercially their most successful record. The thing sold 15 million albums. 
had some of their biggest hits. Uh, the band pretty much, uh, the band didn't dissolve, but they were on their way out after this. And I struggle with this album. So I'm on like the negative side of the divisiveness or the, the polarization here. Uh, and I'm going to go with Brothers in Arms from Dire Straits. So the, I, I think the problem with, the problem with music, the problem with records like this or music like this is that they will sell gazillions of records because they have major hits on them, right? So, so you know, something like this that has Walk of Life that I've learned to hate. I used to love that song so much. I thought that little, like, keyboardy intro was the most hooked thing ever, and I've learned to hate it. Um I still, I still mess with money for nothing. I think that's one of the best rock and roll riffs in the history of the. World. I mean, Absolutely. that thing. Every time, it doesn't matter how many times I've heard that song. When I hear that riff, I just, I'm ready to punch a wall. Um, and I will <laughs> say this about this record: "Brothers in Arms" is probably my second favorite Dire Straits song. I think the title track "Brothers in Arms" is incredible. I would probably only put "Telegraph Road" in, ahead of it. But the rest of this album, I really struggle with. I really struggle with. But that's kind of, the, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? It's like the people that heard Money for Nothing or they heard Walk of Life, they're like, oh, my God, this is Dire Straits. I'm going to go out and buy that record. I'm going to go out and buy that record. I'm going to go out and buy that but record. But how many people bought it just for those songs? Right, and, right. And don't listen saying. to the other songs. We've all it's, bought records because of a song. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's like, I think there's probably a ton of examples of that, right? And for me, that's it. What's interesting is there's so many bands that we love where we say, you know, the hits are good, but the that could top- be a chat topic one week. Oh, oh, why don't you write that down, Rob? Uh, write <laughs> I, can't, little- I can't because this is the only piece of I'll paper I'm gonna need to give this to my wife to make a t shirt. First of all, hold on, what's up with that goatee? It's the same that's on my face, except uh, mine's a little oh, it's, okay, yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's so many bands that we love, Jesus. <laughs> Very gray. Distinguished. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We gotta do it this way. Hold on, hold on. Y- y'all have friggin' facial hair. Y'all, y'all have facial hair. Oh. Y'all. Hmm. Not me. They'd, oh no, the watchers just went down. I know. Right? <laughs> Not like I'm watching. But, but it's a great point. So I don't hate this album. What I will say is that this is true truthfully my least favorite, tied for my least favorite Dire Straits album. I like the four that came before it significantly more and the one that came after it just as much. And I fully recognize how great and popular those songs were. But, you know, like I was saying, how many bands do we listen to where they say, yeah, the hits are good, but it's about the deep cuts. You can't really say that about this record. Like the deep cuts, ain't that. there are no deep, like there, it is what it is. So I will say that. I haven't looked at the comments, so I might be getting absolutely keyword out there but that's okay and and i'm a huge dire straits fan like i put like mark knopfler is up there with like my top 10 greatest musicians of all time like i love that yeah band. i love mark knopfler his um, guitar play, his guitar yeah i mean his there you go there you go john good. appreciate you yeah i mean there you go yeah james's brother in arms made dire straits in the mid 80s almost all most people really liked before that was songs of swing fans either liked the earlier albums, but average average music listeners don't. Mark Knopfler was by far my favorite guitarist. From a guitarist's point of view, there's no dead track by Dire Straits. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty valid point. I'm not a Dire Straits fan, but I do play guitar once in a while. I know so Knopfler yeah. has a uh, he has he's got a new album coming out in the next couple oh. months. Oh really? If you approached an average music listener before Brother in Arms to name Dire Straits songs, they most likely would have said Salt and Swing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'm yeah. guilty. That's true. Sure. George, he knows all the chords. <laughs> I mean, that's a perfect song. A perfect it is. Song. In so many His ways. tone is like, yeah. speaking oh. of Dylan, I mean, he's all over those Dylan 80s records. I mean, it's just, you know, it's him immediately. Well, and there's a lot of bands, you know, I mean, yeah, Dylan, obviously. I mean, people say like Jethro Tull in the 80s were like, oh, yeah, they started starting like Dire Straits. Um, my other double shot before we, you know, I want to be quick on this, but I think it's important because it, I think conceptually it's the same point. There are so many of these bands that blew up commercially, and then it was like, yeah, but is that my band, etc. And mind you, for the viewers out there, like, <coughs> I, 
I try to be as objective as possible with a lot of these things. I love both of these eras. I do love one person significantly more than the other person. I thought the other, per- I thought one person's fine, but he's a clown, and the other person's a badass. So you know, easy. Sorry for swearing on your channel. Hey, I do it all the time. I know. But I know compare- someone last week got a little touchy about it, so I don't want to upset anybody. Well, we got to we got to save the profanity for the after show. Well, you, fucking a. There's there there's there's that and a lot more. So I'm going to talk it briefly, briefly about, about this record. Fifty one fifty, the first of the Van Hagar era Van Halen, because this is a topic that gets people's panties in a bunch, and I love Van Halen. I love Van Halen before this, and I love Van Halen after this. I don't know Van Halen 3 with Gary Sharon enough to make a comment about it, but that's okay. Uh, But I'm a big, 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 big fan of Sammy Hagar. Whether that translates to loving Van Hagar or not, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, talk about a band where, uh, I mean, there's only so many of these types of examples that exist in rock and roll history, right? Like Sammy Hagar... First of all, his record where he's on Montrose's debut is one of the greatest, most undersung hard rock records of the 70s. I mean, that Montrose debut is absurd. And yeah, Ronnie is insane, but like what makes that record is Sammy coming out <laughs> in there. Sammy at this point had a huge solo career. And, and again, Diamond Dave, he's great. We love his we love him doing somersaults and all the different things across the world. But uh you know, this was a polarizing record and became a polarizing band, obviously, through all the stuff with Sammy later on. So I'm curious what the what the nut gallery is saying um, <laughs> about all this stuff, because it, it's the popular thing to say, like, oh, fuck Sammy. Like, they sold out, you know, all that stuff. I think a lot of it is just due to the time, right? Like, if you were following, like, realistically, people, is there that much of a musical difference between 1984 and 5150? Is there that much of a musical difference, or are you just okay. missing Diamond Dave running around doing somersaults? Question for the gallery. Uh, so qu- question for you, Alex. Okay, while you're waiting for the gallery to chime in. Okay, yeah. I don't know shit about Van Halen. I know obviously they exist. I know there's two main guys that people bounce back and forth with. What is the general consensus? Do people prefer like what? Do most people like Sammy? Do most people like Dave? Like what is? What does the general populace say about that? I'd say most like Dave. Like because well, I mean Dave is the original guy. But I mean, like guys like you know, like JC at the flip side, like he'll he'll sing his praises for Sammy. And I know Sammy is about to go on tour with um Michael Anthony and, and mm-hmm. Jason Bonham. Um and Joe Satriani too. Really? Yeah, and Holy Joe shit. Satriani. Um doing like Van Hill, at least call it he's calling it like the best of like both worlds or something. Like what is he? Yeah, that was a that was a comp and a song they did on that record, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Sam, they're because essentially he said that, that Alex Van Halen wasn't interested in going on tour with um, Michael and Sammy, but he wanted to do something for Eddie, who obviously passed away a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's like a school of thought. I mean, Sammy was the most popular based on numbers and and like sold records, which is crazy that I'm actually giving this information, Mister Americana, that I know this information, but. I'm just I'm trying to prove myself that like I know more music than just people that hold banjos is really the whole purpose of me giving this information. <laughs> well, I mean, to the to the original point I was making, right? Of Jason, to your point, like I think if you ask, you know, the heart, the classic hard rock person, they will say we prefer we prefer the Dave era. We prefer the Dave era. Um but they sold more records after that. I mean, that's the thing, right? Of like commercially. I mean, the argument can be made, and I have this theory that it's not that people dislike Sammy, it's they like Dave because Dave is what came first. And I have this theory with music that you like what yeah. you hear first. And yeah. as soon as whether it's so let's say it's it's two artists covering the same song, you generally tend to like the one you hear first because you compare the second yeah. one to the first yeah. one, and I think the same can be said for the lead singers of Van Halen. I'm not a Van Halen fan. I don't have an opinion either way. I could listen to both of them and it really doesn't matter to me. So I think people are just like, that's not my Van Halen anymore. It's something's different. It's not the same. It's not as good. Whether it actually is, I mean, it's all subjective. So 
Yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's, that's just it, right? If like, I mean, they were hugely commercially successful with both, but more so, I mean, really with Sammy, but my thing with Sammy has always been, um, right. I mean, it, that was my point is like commercially, they were selling out all the stadiums. I think a lot of those classic, you know, hard rock fans that grew up with that debut and all those that came after were 11 diamond Dave. I think that sound that 5150 went to was more indicative of the time than it was of the personnel, right? Like, again, mm-hmm. 1984 was already moving in that direction. And it's 1985. Like, they are going to, excuse me, they are going to start doing more of these accessible pop, whatever you want to call it, radio hits. But I don't think there's anybody that really would compare. First of all, let's have a moment. Sammy Hagar is damn near 80 years old. He looks incredible. Yep. 80 years old, and he's the ultimate bro. Like, people just want a vacation and drink <laughs> with Sammy. I remember seeing – I've seen uh, Sammy twice live. Both times he had Michael Anthony playing with him. Because mm-hmm. Sammy and Michael have been very tight over the years. Yep. And it blows my mind that my, he's like 78 years old. And he's just the ultimate bro that hangs out on the beach and drinks tequila and parties. What a man. What a fucking man. Um, yeah. And meanwhile, Dave is out there arguing with Wolfie about whether or not they should reissue the most uh, another kind of truth or whatever it's called, the most recent Van Halen record. Yeah. Tell me who's winning, Sam. All right. I, I'm going to move it along because we're running low on time. So <clears throat> my whole thought process when I was thinking of divisive albums and polarizing artists – there's one band that continually gets mentioned in the vinyl community and the vast majority of the vinyl community says they're awesome in the seventies and everything they did later was shit and garbage and whatever. And that's Aerosmith. Ah, Are you speaking of milk. Yes. There you go. So <laughs> listen, I mean, let's, um, let's ignore the couple albums where, you know, um, Joe Perry wasn't with the band, but like those couple, of the <laughs> but you look at the early stuff, you know, Toys in the Attic, and you know, the self titled album, draw the you know, draw the line, all those they're fantastic, but there's a lot action. of people, they can't look away. There's a lot of people that look at the late 80s, early 90s, Aerosmith, and go, Oh, it sucks, it's commercial, it's shit, it's garbage. That's your opinion. And I think what it has to do, I think, is how old you were when you heard it. We've talked about this in, in, yeah. in relation to other bands as well. Majority of the guys in the VC that are saying 70s Aerosmith is awesome are 15 years older than I am. When this stuff came out in the late 80s, early 90s, I was 12, 14 years old. This was my Aerosmith. You know, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, Janie's got a gun, um, you know, that kind of that those big monster hits <clears throat> from, you know, Permanent Vacation, Pump, Get a Grip. I mean, they were all over, you know, much music here, MTV in the States. And a lot of people go, oh, it's commercial, it sucks. And it comes back to what we've said earlier on. A lot of people go, well, because it's commercial, it's not very good. Well, whatever. I think there's a lot of snobbery out there yeah. but <clears throat> i know I, I i don't think that this aerosmith is any better or any worse than toys in the attic aerosmith i love all of aerosmith mm. i love every single album except music from another dimension because it's a steaming dumpster fire um and you love honking on bobo right the album not actually honking on bobo well you gotta pay make that distinction <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> yes, I do enjoy that album because uh, then paying homage to the blues, and I think they did a good job of it. But I like, I love Toys in the Attic, and I love Draw the Line. I love all that early stuff. Yeah. I just have a certain affinity for this Aerosmith because I was of that age, and I I remember those videos on Much Music, and you know, with with um, Alicia Silverstone. I was I was right in the target demographic age, where I was like, Jesus Christ, that is. Fine looking woman. So, 
that's just this is this is a band that seems to divide a lot of people and i am in the vast minority in the vinyl community that actually likes late 80s early 90s aerosmith but to each their own yeah i'm going to do a double shot as well or do we do we want to do a speed round we got 15 minutes I don't know, but I got to say something. When you were introducing that album and you were saying that most of the BC loves this band and I was wondering if you were going down the road of, I don't even know if you own any of this band, but Steely Dan is like the darling of the BC. I do not own any Steely Dan. I, I, I don't either. And I'm not really a big fan. I get, I I mean, get why they're all right or why they're good, but I thought you were going down the road of Steely Dan. I'm like, shit, Rob's never talked about Steely Dan before. Because I don't have an opinion. I don't like them, but I don't dislike them. If it's on, I'll yeah. sit and enjoy it. But I'm like, eh, whatever. Just don't have an opinion. Let me just quickly see some Aerosmith here. Uh, I'm down with 80s Aerosmith. Awesome. <clears throat> I like the late Aerosmith albums, but was a fan of theirs in the 70s. Cool. Dude looks like a lady. I think people hate it because it's pop Aerosmith. Yeah. But it's it's not. It's rock that was popular. And there's a distinction, I think, between rock yeah. and pop. But I mean, it's the it's the classic, like <clears throat> it's a cl SAT word, right? It's like the classic gatekeeping sort of thing, right? Of like, that's my band. Right. Like, th that my band is reserved for me and my close friends who have yeah. been seeing them since the clubs. And when they start showing up in playing in stadiums, that, no, that's not, you don't know them like I know them, right? Like true. Sort of the vibe, right? True, true. We got a speed round. We got 15 minutes. Can we do, do a speed? You, you got something sure. quick, Sam? Yeah. It's probably yeah, Bob Dylan. I went through the rest of my um, stat because it actually, it, they all kind of work um, in tandem with one another. So, again, I, I'm talking about Dylan. Um, so let's jump from self-portrait 1970 to um, 79. And this is probably, other than the electric period, this is probably Dylan at his most divisive. This is when he put out this trilogy of records. Um, this is his gospel slash Christian um, series of records with Slow Train coming, Saved, yeah. and Shot of Love, which Shot of Love is in my top four or five favorite Dylan records. Because oh, it has wow. my favorite Dylan song, which is "Every Grain of Sand." Every grain, every grain of that sand. Every grain of sand. And when I saw Dylan back in uh, November, um, I saw him twice back in November, and he did, he closed both shows with that song. I was the first song, the first time I saw him, I was like my eyes were misty, and the second time was just like gut wrenching. Um, this is Dylan. I mean, you know, he's got like Mick Taylor is playing on these. I think Knopfler is playing on this record. Um, you know, and it's it's just it's just such a such a swift change from what Dylan was. Because I mean, before these records, you had his album um, Street Street Legal, um, where he had you know stuff like Changing of the Guards, Senor, New New Pony was on here, and then you have these records with like you know um, Slow Train Coming, um, Gotta Serve Somebody, you have um, Saved Covenant Woman property of jesus i mean just blatant like gospel songs and dylan was just panned for this in the 70s and early 80s um and so it's just it's just so cool that this has come back to be like you know this fantastic like you know resurgence of dylan because if you listen to like some of the live stuff if you take away dylan's vocals just the band it's just incredible incredible music um so i highly recommend you know the um, bootleg series which is called trouble no more um, how to check out those records. You got that, Sam? Yeah, yeah, I've got the deluxe version, the big one. Um, I remember buying the, I got the, was it four LPs maybe? I have the box set. I remember I bought it from a local oh, yeah. store for, I don't know if I've listened to it. Sorry. He just advertised it as the Jesus set. Your, your, your guy did? Yeah. Um, so jumping, <laughs> jumping ahead really quick to the, the early 90s this is post uh, traveling wilbury's bob he put out these two records called um trouble no more and um crap what's the other one good as i've been to you these are just this is the first time dylan went fully acoustic since his uh uh folk albums in the early 60s he, he's just doing traditional folk and traditional tunes like he does stuff like frog you went a courting on here um 
uh, Jim Jones, Black Jack Davy, Delia, Stack of Lee, which the Grateful Dead did a, did a stagger Lee. I'm not a crazy fan of these records. Um, they vocally, and again, I love Dylan's voice. I do. But his voice on these two records just, just does not do it for me for some mm -hmm. reason. It just does not do it for me. Even though it's just Dylan on guitar and harmonica, I can't do it. But anyway, that's Dylan picking another turn, kind of a resurgence, like a refresh to himself because after these records, you know, you jump ahead to 1997. That's when he put out Time Out of Mind, which is with uh, Daniel Lenoir, which was a huge career resurgence. And really from 1997 up to the present day, um, he's kind of been on, like, on a career boom um, in his, in his, you know, 60s, 70s, um, now into his 80s. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, again, I'll, I'll be really quick. I'm sorry. Um, similar kind of thing. Another trilogy of, you know, covers albums. He did these three crooner albums that were kind of revolved around like Sinatra kind of songs. So like he put out Shadows in the Night, uh, Fallen Angels, and then Triplicate, which Triplicate is a triple album. It, it was three discs, all 33 minutes long. So he essentially put out five discs worth of crooner material from between 2015 up until 2017. Crazy, just a crazy amount of material that he recorded. I think it really gave him a new voice vocally because before that, like in 2007, 8, 9, um, 2012, his voice was just about gone. Um, and then he like – he pulled back. He started practicing some more with his voice. And really, he's been using this voice since 2014 or 15. And it's it's just on wonders for his tour, for his records that he's put out since then. Um, and so, like, I, again, divisive, yes, because, I mean, what's Bob Dylan doing singing the standards? But at the same time, it's essentially, like, cleaned up his voice. To A lot of times when, you, when he sings now, you can hear a lot of, like, Wilbury's Bob from, like, the, the late 80s. So, Anyway, I could I could talk again, as y'all can tell, I can talk all day about, about Bob Dylan. Um, he's like the most divisive artist of all time. But I love it. Love it. But anyway. I could listen to you talk about Dylan all day. That's so cool. I can't believe up. that you're you're such a diehard, but you're totally humble enough to say I don't like his voice in this, which is you know a testament yeah. to you more than anything. Yeah, those but, two uh, records are, are tough for me. You know what's right. always bothered you what bothered me about Dylan that if you want to listen to a live version of your favorite like album version song, you'll never get a live version of the album nope. version. He keeps switching it up. The son of a bitch will just always change it. It's like, I just want to hear you do it like this, which yeah. to his credit, that's what a real artist would do. It's like, I'm going to do what the hell I want, not what the fans want. Right. And that's, you got to respect him for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, Jason, you're up. Sam doesn't know right. what lightning round means. So you're up. Yeah, no, no, into your Sam, Sam took my lightning round. I really don't have anything. It'd be I'm just, I'm just kidding, Sam. It's all good. It's all I, good. I don't care. You go all ahead, we're bro. doing is we're making Alex run late for the after show. So who gives a shit? No, I'm good. I'm, not, I'm kind of tapped out here. So you guys go ahead. Next one. Ah, come on, Alex. You need to come back here, man. You're next. There he is. You got one more, Alex, for the speed round? Because Jason's tapped out. He doesn't have anything else. Yeah. So it's a good thing Sam ran along there. Oh, there we go. Mr. Professional YouTube with his well, uh, Mr. Professional also Mr. Broken Computer. Um, okay, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll do a couple of speed round things just for the for the sake of the speed round. Um, how about uh, when Genesis, the, one of the greatest progressive rock bands of all time, when Genesis goes pop? Now I'll show a couple records here because I think these are two distinct sort of uh, examples. One of my favorite, well, I hate to call it ladder career because we're talking like 1980 or whatever. Um, I love Duke. I Duke, so Duke comes out in 1980. This had some of the hits, right? So this has Turn It On Again, uh, which a lot of people know, and I think Misunderstanding too. Um, you know, Turn It On Again was a, a hit, but it was a hit in an odd time signature. So it's like one of those, like, that's weird. Um they kind of, I don't want to say they lost me after this, but like this to me is the last great, uh, for me, for a prog fan, the last great Genesis record. Um, and this is for Sam, because I know he loves this because he's such a vanilla boy. 
Um, is, <laughs> do that again, Sam. <laughs> when, you, when you Sam and single as hell, the only kind of touch you know is that invisible touch. Okay, <laughs> so they. <laughs> The stranger. <laughs> Look, I love. I uh, I hate to say. I've always loved that song, Sam. Um, it's just, but but this is the time in the Genesis career where what was Genesis and what was Phil Collins solo was ind- indistinguishable, right? Like, like oh, Su Su Studio is that what Genesis record? They're like, oh no, it's Phil Solo. You know, it's like this whole thing. But you have Invisible Touch. Tonight, 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 which that's a Phil Solo song, right? Land of Confusion, with the exception of the wacky music video that I think was about Reagan at the time, was just very wacky. I've always kind of dug that song. I think was it um was it Disturbed who did a later cover version of Land of Confusion, maybe? Um, and then throwing it all away, another just sort of poppy 80s song. But you do have, you know, to keep reminding people that they are a prog band at their core, they throw in Domino, which has part one and part two. So that's when you know. And the Brazilian. I think both of those are like prog songs. Um, but yeah, so there's uh, there's that. Um, another couple of quick uh, quick bangers, as it were. Um, I will always advocate for this band. I love this band. Rob, you and I have talked about this a lot, how for some reason in the VC, AOR of the late 70s and early 80s has just become like the funnest genre to just poop on yep. all the time. Yep. I'm going to show you all a perfect record, a perfect record. It has both the hits that we all love. And it's got some deep cups, deep cuts, deep cups, different that are. <laughs> I, you said something else. <laughs> I was like, Rob, can you can tell you we're here in the after too? dark here in three minutes? Yeah, man. Sticks. The grand illusion is a perfect, perfect hard rock, progressive rock album absolutely incredible and people like to shat all over this band uh for reasons unknown to me but um yeah i mean obviously you have uh grand illusion the title tracks amazing fooling yourself angry young man big hit come sail away everybody's heard that song enough times but the big thing you have man in the wilderness which is a tommy shaw song that just smacks uh, Miss America, which is a JY song. Again, one of these bands that has three lead singers and three completely main distinctive songwriters. Sticks is amazing. I'm all in on Sticks, and I show uh, that record because that's just their magnum opus. But I show this too. This is Sticks Crash of the Crown. This came out a couple of years ago. An outstanding late career band for those of you who have written off Sticks or never cared about them or whatever. This is outstanding. Amazing hard rock, progressive rock. I don't think a lot of people would call Sticks a prog band, but they certainly had progressive elements, especially on this stuff. Later career, super proggy, all in. Want to give my two or three minutes towards Sticks? Awesome. That's it. All Cheers. right. I've saved the best for last. There it comes. I've there also comes. saved it for last because if we lose all the viewers, it's going to be okay. But this is an album that Alex and I have passionate opinions about, <clears throat> and it's divisive. <laughs> Are you ready, Alex? That we can chat about this. Get your get I'm, your beer poured there. Am I am I ready for it, Rob? Are you ready? For, are you ready for it? Okay, oh, let's have it. Let's have it. There we go. We're going to talk a little bit of reputation here. Some tea swizzle. <laughs> Alex and I are big Swifties. Yeah. So <laughs> Sam leaves. Sam's out. Gone. Sam's out. Bye, Sam. <laughs> yes, John. It ends with Taylor. So what? Um, Taylor, Marcia, we, we, this this oh, conversation, Marsha just asked for for some Kid Rock. Marsha, this this conversation isn't big enough for Kid Rock. So, <laughs> so I mean, this I mean, Taylor's div- divisive in and of herself, right? A lot of people got just dismiss her as stupid pop and you know whatever. And and Alex and I vehemently disagree with the popular opinion. We think she's great for many reasons, but in the context of her discography, you know, she started off country pop and, you know, did red, which, you know, was a fairly highly regarded album in the mm-hmm. pop music uh, pantheon, I guess. And she went very pop in 1989. And then, and then she comes out with this, which is, which is kind of pissed off Taylor and, she gets into a lot of the, the 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 beats and a little bit of there's some 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 rapper guy on here and 
I personally don't like this <laughs> album. I, I love Taylor. I love everything she did after this. I mean, Folklore and Evermore, I think, are awesome. Midnight's is great. I can't do this record. Uh, and I think that's my age because I'm obviously – I'm not the target demographic of this music by any means. I'm, I'm 46 years old and I'm not a teenage girl. So um, there's just some stuff I hear that I'm just like, this, I don't get. That said, there are a couple songs in here that I think are awesome. Getaway Car is a great song. Don't Blame Getaway Me is fantastic. Yeah. But there's just some, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of people who would go, yeah, no, <laughs> not doing it. And and I I don't I don't listen to this record ever, but I yeah. love what it led to. So, and and a bunch of people on the other side that say that's the greatest, like that's her greatest thing she's ever done, right? Well, like, you think of it, you think about her re-recording campaign where she's re-recording the first six albums she did with Big Machine. There's two left. There's her self-titled debut, and there's Reputation. And Reputation is the one that everyone has been waiting for. I personally go, yeah, whatever. My wife loves it. My son loves it. It's their favorite, but I, yeah, whatever. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the take? Like, I know I talked to Sam the other day about like sports in the States and watching football and stuff. What is the impact that I, this is sort of off topic, but not really. It's Taylor Swift. How is the Taylor Kansas city chiefs thing nope. playing out right now? I don't want to talk about it. I'll talk like, about it. I want to talk. I want to talk about this. Okay, go. I, I, this is super interesting. No, and this is interesting to me too. I, f I'm gonna swear. I fucking hate football. Mm. There is not a thing on the <laughs> face the of viewers. this earth that I would rather do. Is worse than I, I'll go to the dentist and have a root canal before I'll watch football. Dear I oh. hate. I hate football <laughs> that much. Wow. We are now a football house. My wife and my son watch the Chiefs every week when they play. Uh, and, I go, nice, though. And, I, and I go, that's great. We got five TVs in this house. Pick one that's not the one that, the room that I'm in. And, and we're good. I, don't, I have no interest in watching. But I did read an interesting article today where there was a bunch of, you know, like football dads who, whose daughters are now interested in football because of Taylor being interested in football, that they're actually sitting down to watch a football game with their son. And then it's bringing a new demographic wow. of people to the game. What a life changer. And the flip side to this is you get the people who bitch and moan that, oh, they're showing Taylor on the, foot, uh, the football game. She might get shown for maybe 60 seconds in a three-hour game, and it's in between play. So who gives a shit? Shut up. And the other interesting thing that I read is, I don't know, it was someone within the Chiefs organization was saying that since she started going to Chiefs games, they estimate that it's generated almost $400 million in sales of an uh, increase in sales in Chiefs apparel since she started. And I'm going, all of that's got to be good for football. Why not, right? Well, yeah, but it's not like the NFL needs our help. No, it doesn't. But if you're the owner of the Chiefs, wouldn't you like another four hundred million dollars in your pocket? I certainly would. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a a long conversation for sure. Uh, well, I mean that's just a such a complex thing. I mean, I'm kind of with. Look at you go, Jason. Look at that. Look what look just that. arrived. Oh Thank man, God. I hope look what just not, came. Yeah, I hope the right records are in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean. Right. Like she's a she's arguably the most powerful person in the world right now. Right. From like a pop yeah. or artistic standpoint. I think it has a lot of influence in whatever she chooses to do. I'll, I'll say funny. Here's what I'll say. I'll say it's funny. It's like everybody is gooping their shorts about this kind of stuff. They love it. They think it's the cutest, most puppy loving thing ever. As if they know these people, because that's what fandom does, right? Like people actually pretend that they know the inner workings of relationships and how they work. And these people don't know anything, a single thing about Travis Kelsey. A, a single thing about Travis Kelsey. Okay. They just know the way that she looks at him, which is all they okay. care about, to be frank. Sorry, go on a Marian. Which that's because how I look at you guys. Okay. It was let me let me be the asshole devil's advocate here. What is it hurting anyone? It's not. Oh, oh, it's not hurting anybody. It's it's good well, for football. It's good for her. 
It's bringing new fans into either her or more so football. Yep. Like, I can't say anything bad about it. I think it's pretty adorable. It's like cool. Getting that babu bot. Hold on. It is adorable because that's what we need is more rich. (laughs) We need more rich people on the top of their game being happy while the rest of us suffer. Right, Sam? So, <laughs> right, <Sam. laughs> yeah, let me go get some more of my Miller Lite. Yeah. Oh, I was like, but, you know, but here's the, here's what I think is that it's a, I actually don't, it's good. It's, I mean, who's it good for? Who knows? It's good for rich people, which is great. That's what matters. But my thing is always, I've just never gotten into the whole getting interested in these rock, these movie stars, these super pop cultural icons that don't give a flying F about any of you people and just want your money. Right. And we invest so much of our emotional worth into their personal workings that it's like, what are we doing? You know, the thing is with Travis Kelsey, I don't mind Travis Kelsey, but here's the thing. Taylor has positioned herself as the ultimate um, corporate feminist. I'll use that term corporate feminist. And the problem is, is she's dating Travis Kelsey. And when people are like, oh, Travis Kelsey, she's like, oh, for all the Brads, Chads, and Dads. I'm like, you realize that your boyfriend is the ultimate Brad and Chad, right? Like, you you all know that Travis Kelsey is like the ultimate bro of bros. So much so that a month before they started dating, he was getting in trouble because he punched a teammate in the face during practice because he let his temper get the best of him. But no one wants to talk about that. Because he's perfect. You know why he's perfect? Because Taylor is happy. And that's all that matters, <laughs> Jason. My thing, I love happiness, peace in the Middle East, and, and happiness everywhere. That's all that matters, Jason. I'm glad they're happy. I hope they're happy. I'm so <laughs> glad that Travis Kelsey, I'm so glad that she was able, you know, there are more important things than dating the star of the football team. I learned that from Taylor Swift. How'd that go for her? And also that she was able to use this relationship that everybody is obsessed about to get over the fact that she was dating a freaking racist for a long time who was really problematic. But we don't talk about that anymore either because, look, Taylor's been through a lot, people. She has faced the adversity of having rich parents her entire career. Man, let's drink, huh? (laughs) Ask me to that. What a rant. It's about time for the after dark. And there's no better place to end this conversation. Thank Racer, you, everybody. Thank you, dark. everybody, for watching. Alex, I will join you in. I will join you in a few minutes, and I will be back. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We will be back next week on Glenn Calloway's channel. Subscribe to Jason Arsenal, Alex Beer and Vinyl, and Sam St. John, and myself, Northern Revolutions. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Good night, guys. Right. I love yeah. you all. Yes.